Okay, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you all may be joining us from. And of course, good afternoon to everybody in the room and thank you for being here. Um, so my name's uh, Tom Dallison and I'm with the uh, Marine Mammals developers of the Marine Mammals Management Toolkit. Um, I'm very pleased to, to welcome you all to this Marine Mammal Knowledge Exchange, exchange kindly hosted in collaboration with Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and for all of us in the room here, for our final partners workshop of the Marine Mammals Twinning, which is hosted at the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary headquarters um, in Situate, um, just south of Boston. So very quickly, uh, before I hand over for introductory remarks and welcome remarks, just a very quick run through of how the agenda and how this afternoon and um, in this session will will pan out. So um, we'll have some opening remarks and I'll give you a quick run through of sort of how the format of this session will work. Um, and then we'll move through uh, various threats and activities and really looking at how uh, actions are being undertaken in terms of management to, to limit um, and address these threats and activities. Um, and then we'll break out into some uh, group discussion with those in the room, but also, of course, for, for all of you online. And I'll go through in a, uh, after opening remarks on how, how we'll take those questions. Then we'll have ship strikes. We'll possibly break for a coffee break, depending on where we are with timing, um, entanglement, while watching. And then hopefully that will bring us up to a nice rounding close at around about 5 p.m. our time here um, in the US. So no further ado, very much happy to hand over to Pete Nicola, Superintendent for Stellwagen and Bank National Marine Sanctuary, um, and also Ben Haskell as well, who will be joining in. But the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone in the room. Welcome, everyone online, situated in Massachusetts. Um, uh, I guess we'll go right into our remarks here. Um, Okay. <laughs> Photo of um, first thing we thought we're like fuck Sarah. Most people online, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So a famous photo of, of, a, of a humpback whale breaching uh, with our 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 vessel in the in the foreground um, uh, happens to be on one of the, the stamps that was created to celebrate the 50th um, anniversary of the sanctuary program. We're not doing this, so we're going to side. Yeah. So next slide, please. Um, okay. As as uh, as we mentioned, Stellagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary is just uh, offshore from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, our office is in Situate, which is fairly close to the southern portion of Stellwagen Bank, as you can see from the chart on the right side of the screen. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, our sanctuary program in the United States was uh, created in 1972, um, so turning 50 years um, last year, uh, and then uh, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary was designated uh, as a sanctuary in 1992. So as our program turned 50, we turned 30 years old. Um, and as you can see from the map on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, it's essentially an underwater extension of Cape Cod, uh, measuring 682 square nautical miles uh, in size, um, and roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island here in the United States. Not a very big sanctuary um, as in terms of our system, uh, but um, it's it's ours uh, and the only one in, in the Northeast United States. Um, and uh, you can see from the, the boundaries um, near the shoreline, uh, we're, we're located entirely in federal waters. So um, some sanctuaries co-manage with, with state agencies. We are entirely uh, in federal waters, so we don't <coughs> co-manage. Um, so we're all on our own here, and uh, our vision for our, our program is to uh, ensure that uh, a productive sanctuary that protects diversity um, and uh, respects the sustainable human activities of which there's a substantial amount of that uh, that occur in Stellwagen, uh, and we're trying to advance uh, stewardship as well. So next slide, please. 
why is Stellag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary a special place? Well, the, the ocean currents uh, and, the, and the geography make it a, a very special place. Um, with the, uh, the, the main coastal current coming from north to south, uh, and you can see from the topography here on this, uh, this slide that uh, uh, the tidal action and the currents uh, bring nutrients from deeper waters to the bank uh, where the, the sunlight um, creates photosynthesis and feeds a very productive uh, food web. Next slide. Um, the biodiversity uh, is uh, extraordinary uh, in Stellina Bank, uh, the highest uh, in, in the entire Gulf of Maine. 575 different species ranging from, from phytoplankton to, um, to large charismatic megafauna like uh, humpback and right whales and all sorts of uh, species in between. Next slide. Uh, Stellwagen Bank is also at the crossroads of several, several um, uh, well-trafficked shipping lanes. Uh, and as a result, over the past 400 years, I know for most of you, 400 years is a drop in the bucket. For us, it's substantial here in the States. Um, uh, we have uh, um, a number of shipwrecks uh, that are documented in, in, in the sanctuary as well. Um, and those sanctuaries, uh, I'm sorry, those shipwrecks are, are shown on the, uh, the chart on the right where the black dots are. And the, the heat map um, you see from low green to high red is, is fishing activity. So as you can see, there's a bit of a conflict there um, uh, between uh, fishing activity and, uh, and uh, the, the safety of the shipwrecks uh, as they are the time capsules that are on the, the bottom of the ocean floor. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have a lot of human activity, human uses, uh, ranging from shipping. We have a large... Um, traffic separation scheme uh, that uh, uh, brings traffic into the Port of Boston and out of the Port of Boston. And uh, we also have a, a large amount of commercial fishing, recreational fishing, recreational boating, uh, and whale watching uh, that occur in Stellwagen Bank as well. Excellent. Um, in terms of dollars, um, you can see there's some significant economic activity in what we call the blue economy. Um, uh, of note, the whale watching is, is, is the largest number on the screen um, and uh, also followed closely by commercial and recreational fishing. Um, so it's a very important part of the regional economy uh, and uh, important uh, that uh, and part of the ecosystem services or the, the benefits derived from our, our, our sanctuary. Next slide. So how do we manage this area? We uh, we engage uh, in, in resource protection by working with um, agencies that manage fisheries, our National Marine Fisheries Service, um, the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission, and other agencies that help us um, manage fisheries and, and try and uh, craft regulations uh, to minimize the impacts of commercial fishing on sanctuary resources. We permit activities in Stellagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, uh, such as research, and, um, and uh, other activities uh, as necessary. We, we work with other federal agencies who have jurisdictions over pollution, uh, the EPA and the US, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US and also the US Coast Guard um, and also um, uh, um, uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, uh, anyway, and we work with uh, NOAA law enforcement uh, to enforce regulations as well. We need to work with other partners because our Sanctuaries Act doesn't give us um, any law enforcement authority of our own. So it's very important that we work with other, other federal and state agencies. State agencies also enforce fisheries laws in Stellar and Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Um, we can have a very vibrant and, and, and uh, um, uh, active research and monitoring program. Uh, and uh, we do work uh, uh, with on our maritime heritage, uh, program to protect the shipwrecks that are in the sanctuary. And we also conduct education and outreach to increase awareness of the public about what we do here at Stellar Bank. And we get a lot of input from the, our sanctuary advisory council which uh, provides us input from all the different stakeholder groups that we, we, um, we work with in Stellar Bank. Next slide, please. How do we do this? We do this with a very small staff. Um, there's, and, uh, 
this is our staff here. We have um, 14 full-time or part-time and then uh, some other part-time folks that help us with vessel operations. So given this small staff, we, we punch way above our weight in terms of impacts that we, we, can, uh, we can make on the, uh, the sanctuary. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our reef perch vessel, the Mighty Auk, uh, shown here at high speed, um, not during a time when right whales are in the area, of course. Um, but uh, we, we work out of Citric Mash, which is the, uh, the red star on that map because of its proximity to Stellwagen uh, Bank. And the, the, the research that we conduct is all, all, all conducted on, on Stellwagen. Next, next slide, please. Let's see, this is our, our management plan. So our management plan guides our staff activities uh, for the next 10 years or so. Um, it's uh, 226 pages. So I thought it was more. It seems like more if you're reading it. Um, but uh, actually, the plan itself is only 70 to 75 pages. Um, and then there's some other um, background. And there's also the environmental assessment, uh, which is part of our, our regulations to make sure that we're not negatively impacting the sanctuary by managing. Um, so we have to make that case in our, our management plan as well. Um, there, as I said, 15 action plans containing strategies, I think there's 78 strategies. So there's quite a bit of activity in our plan. Um, and this was all drafted by a working group of our advisory council uh, with staff assistance. So um, there's been a lot of, a lot of input from the public we, we went through a public scoping uh, period before we drafted the management plan. When we put together a draft management plan, we had a, um, uh, a, a public comment period on our draft plan as well. So we received lots of input from the public. Our final plan was released in August of this year um, and uh, it, in, it includes all these things. So next slide, please. Um, our management plan goals are aligned with the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries goals. Um, and those are ensure a thriving sanctuary, increasing support for the sanctuary system, deepening our understanding of this of what occurs in sanctuaries, and then uh, ensuring that we have the support we need to do our mission. And then the action plans are all um, lined up underneath the different goals. Next slide. So this is mostly to just show you the really cool video that we took of uh, of the of a whale being tagged by a drone. Uh, but those are all our management plan uh, uh, activities. Uh, so yeah, there's, so there's a, a, a say whale being tagged by a drone feeding with her calf um, and, uh, and she continues feeding after, after she's been tagged and we don't see that sort of activity when we tag with poles. So drone is a very, um, very good way to, uh, to tag whales. Next one. Um, this is sort of an example of what an action plan looks like. There's different strategies. So this is the Marine Mammal Protection Action Plan. It contains five strategies. And so um, one of the challenges when you put together a plan is you can't do everything you want to do because you don't have the resources to do it. So we have to go through a prioritization exercise. And that's what we did with our plan. Um, so we would take these five strategies. Next slide, please. And we created um, some criteria to assess our action plans. Uh, uh, these are the five that we used. Uh, I'm sorry, the four that we used. There, there are other criteria you can use, and, and they're really based on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but these are what we looked at. So each scheme um, carries uh, uh, a different description. Uh, so next slide, please. So for impact, um, we, we assign scoring values based on some sort of um, you know, some sort of description of, of you know zero would be minimal and nine would be high. Uh, we also weighted our each of these criteria based on different um, different aspects of what was important to us. Feasibility is very important to us because if if we can't get something done, there's really no point in investing a lot of resources in doing it. So. Feasibility was weighted very high. Um, and uh, each of these um, criteria have a scoring value system so that different people can score and actually have a, have a good sense of, of what, they're, what they're assigning their values uh, to. So next slide. So 
So this is what the, the end result looks like is we end up with, um, you know, if you're doing your job right, uh, um, you have highs, mediums, and lows because everything can't be high. If everything's important, then nothing's important. Um, and then uh, and uh, and then it's important to look at these strategies and say, are we doing these? And how are we funding them? Um, so we, we fund our strategies either through um, appropriations from our Congress um, or we fund them through uh, grants from either um, uh, from private organizations or from other federal agencies uh, in the U.S. government. Um, those are external funds uh, and our internal funds are the appropriated funds we get and our appropriated funds really cover mostly salaries for staff and some project and vessel operations. And then uh, we have masters um, uh, who can find other funding sources and research partners like Dr. Dave Wiley here so that um, we can conduct research and uh, better understand uh, what occurs in the sanctuary and how to protect our sanctuary resources like marine mammals. So that's what happens here. Next slide. And then we sort of need to know, we need to figure out how, how much things cost so that we know what to ask for, what the bill is for all these services. Um, so we go through um, just a, a simple process of looking at, uh, there's, you know, some, there's, there's non-labor costs for equipment and travel and whatnot. And then, um, then there's staff time. We need to add staff time into the mix. Um, and, uh, and also we, we rely heavily on volunteers. So volunteers are technically free, but you also need to factor in that they need to be managed and, and, uh, and coordinated and someone is responsible for that. So there's a cost to that as well, even though they're volunteers. So you know, figuring out the labor costs then the, and, the, and the action and the equipment costs and the, and the travel costs. And then, uh, so for our, our, our plan, we did this over a 10 year period since that was the expected lifespan of the plan. And uh, um, it's important, uh, not necessarily for continuing projects like these, uh, but if you had a project that was say long to be five years long, you'd want to average that cost out over the 10 years. So that's where we average everything over 10 years. And then we come with a, with a strategy cost per year so that I can give my boss uh, at headquarters um, a bill for for services rendered and uh, and he'll tell me well that's nice that's great Pete but uh, we don't have as much money so then it it falls back on us to figure out what gets done and what doesn't get done so that's it and that's management 101 and that's that's how I, I'm, I'm assuming the works works that way for everyone else in the room here and everyone else online uh, anyone can manage if you've got enough resources um, and uh, the challenge we face is 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 Doing our jobs and, and I find resources that uh, um, that, uh, that that allow us to do that. Next slide, please. Oh, oh, we talked about that already. Um, yeah, so basically, we had the resources to fund forty six out of the seventy eight strategies when we take a long, hard look at the management plan. So. Um, we um, we set about doing the work, and then we identify other other sources of funding in order to uh, uh, to do as much as we can with as much as we have. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, historically, uh, we've been sort of about um, received about uh, or obtained roughly half of what what we expect we we need over the next ten years. Um, and uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So um, if we can find more money, we, we will. And we, we, we're continually um, looking for more, more resources, research partners um, to, to do our job. Next slide. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a good chunk of, the, uh, of the, uh, the management plan was an environmental assessment. Um, uh, to make sure that we're complying with other U.S. laws, um, the Endangered Species Act, the Magnuson-Stevens is our Fisheries Management Act, uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, and other uh, Coastal Zone Management Act, and other 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 acts, other relevant laws in the in the marine environment. Uh, and uh, and fortunately, we found that our activities uh, have adver the adverse impacts from our activities are negligible. Um, uh, they're not zero, but they're negligible. Um, 
and that uh, we should continue uh, with our proceeding with our management plan. Next slide. And then um, the next step in our plan, which we're currently in right now, is to implement it. Um, and uh, and that means developing uh, some metrics, uh, which are which are, are that's that's the stuff that makes your hair hurt. Um, I had a full head of hair when we started this process. So um, and uh, and now look at me if you can see me online. Uh, uh, it, this is the hard work, uh, figuring out how to do things, uh, timelines, managing staff, and and then uh, assessing our progress uh, to uh, know if we're doing our job uh, or seeing how successful we are at it. Uh, so uh, that's our next step in the process. Next slide, please. Okay. Oh, um, I'm not recording right now. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Um, so we're in the process, as he said, about evaluating our uh, management effectiveness and performance. And uh, not only will we use the, uh, the metrics and indicators in the management plan for each action plan, but we'll also use the self-assessment tool that the Marine Mammals Twinning has been developing over the last three years. And the tool is uh, part of the toolkit. Um, and I'll describe the other components of the toolkit in a minute. But I decided to apply the uh, self assessment tool to our now completed management plan and, um, and went through it. Um, it takes you know, almost two hours to go through the, uh, the, the tool itself. Um, and it's very detailed. You have to answer the questions. Um, and we ended up with a score of 7.8 um, out of 10. And that will serve as our baseline um, for um, implementing this management plan. And our intention is to go through this uses tool um, about, we could do it every year, but probably more every three years. Um, and see how our uh, how our score changes over time and hopefully improves. Um, Seven point eight is um, is not a bad score, I suppose, but we hope that it uh, uh, improves and um, maybe someday we'll reach a hundred or <clears throat> we'll reach ten out of ten. Um, the uh, the the tool is broken down by different groups framework, uh, activities and threats, research and monitoring, outreach and engagement, and management effectiveness. Um, and uh, the areas that uh, we scored lower in were addressing activities and threats and uh, outreach and engagement. Next slide, please. So uh, the reason why we scored 7.8 and not nine um there are two reasons um <laughs> first um uh, with regard to uh whale watching we uh have only voluntary guidelines here in the northeast um we don't have approach regulations uh for whale watchers whether they be commercial or private uh we only have gui uh, voluntary guidelines the only regulation we have around whales is for the right whale, where you are required to stay um, uh, 1,500 feet away um, um, at all times because they are highly endangered. <clears throat> but for the other uh, large whales, uh, it's just voluntary. So um, that's one of the reasons why uh, we scored um, at 7.8 out of 10. <clears throat> um, another reason is uh, marine mammal bycatch. We have a problem with entanglement of, of whales uh, in uh, fishing gear line, primarily lobster buoy line, which are vertical lines that span the water column and um, whales frequently swim into them and and they get entangled uh, on some part of the whale. 
uh, and in some cases can kill them or certainly injure them. So, uh, so that's another reason why we scored it uh, the way that we did. Um, next slide, please. So the overall toolkit uh, is composed of not only the self-assessment tool, but fact sheets, a community of practice and uh, good practices that, um, that are used, in other words, success stories that are used around the world and can be a model for other uh, marine protected areas. But um, the self-assessment tool can be used when you're developing a new management plan for protecting marine mammals. Um, it's really helpful for uh, understanding the full suite of things that uh, you need to think about uh, when you're protecting marine mammals. Uh, it can also be used to evaluate an existing plan, which is our case. So uh, we found it a very, very helpful, well-designed tool um, for doing that, and we hope to continue to use it. So that's it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ben, and thank you very much, Pete. And uh, as always, great to, to have in, uh, an in-depth introduction to sort of where we are and why we're here, and also the reflections, of course, from Stellwagen on, on using the toolkit. And I guess what's really brought us together, not only today, but over the past three, four, and, and, and five years. So um, again, thank you very much um, for, for your words. So we'll power on through and I'll be super quick on this so we can we, we can make some time. Um, so essentially for, for all of those online and, and for those in the room, we'll go through four topics as we saw in the agenda. So we'll look at um, noise pollution, uh, ship strikes, entanglement and well watching. Um, and the intention really is here to for each topic to have a presentation um, from uh, Sterling Bank staff or Office of National Marine Sanctuaries um, and then we'll take some time to, to discuss those as well because not only do we have experience online but also in the room as well we have managers from France, uh, Bermuda, uh, colleagues from Mexico as well that have all um, experienced some of these activities and threats and also implemented management as well so it's really an opportunity to uh, discuss practices um, and also uh, discuss the various topics um, in a bit more detail. And, and we've got about 45 minutes for each um, for each um, for each topic. For those that want to ask questions, um, those in the room, of course, make, make it make yourself aware that you want to ask a question. And for those online, please do use the chat function ask them during the presentation. Um, or if you have a question during the discussion point, please raise your hand um, and you'll be given the floor. Um, we will try and get through as many questions as we can, but please don't be shy. Um, and very quickly, probably should have done this at the start, um, but if, uh, again, please do raise your hand, um, please try and keep yourself muted as well, um, and we'll, uh, we'll monitor everything including in the chat, and this is being recorded, so if you don't wish to be on camera, um, please turn off your video. And that being said, we'll move on to our first um, our first topic, so we'll look at noise pollution, and this again is presented by uh, Layla Hatch who is working with the um, Office of National Marine Sanctuaries as the Marine Ecologist and Bioacute uh, Division. Oh, maybe that's how you pronounce it. But Leila, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? We can indeed, yeah. And you should right. have, you share your screen. Um, okay. I'm going to try. All right. Are you seeing a presentation? Um, you can see it perfectly and hear you perfectly. Great. Well, it's a real pleasure to be invited to be with you all today. Um, I'm really sorry that I'm here for a shorter portion of time than you have scheduled. I'm here till for just the next 25 minutes, but I'm going to try to um, shorten um, a couple of my remarks and hopefully we can have a little bit of discussion at the same time and I will make this presentation available and 
Um, we can, can continue conversations. Um, I snuck the words listening into my title because of course the reason we are concerned about underwater noise in um, marine environments is because we are listening and animals are listening. They're using the underwater environment. Um, so very quickly, because I think you guys have, have uh, done quite a bit of work on threats previously, uh, just a reminder that this is uh, the sonic world underwater in our marine protected areas is incredibly important to a real diversity of the species that inhabit these spaces from the communications between each other um, through to foraging, detecting predators uh, making navigational decisions. But the other components of those underwater spaces um, it are um, the, the roles that we play in introducing noise into this environment um, in through, um, that, uh, through activities um, near and around and in marine protected areas, as well as other natural forces that introduce sound into what in totality we call the soundscape. But we don't, um, in most spaces, have management directed at, that total, at the totality, that is, at the soundscape. We do manage soundscapes um, as a directed authority in U.S. national parks on land, but underwater, we manage the, uh, the noise that is experienced by animals when it is determined to be an injury. And we do that through a real complexity of uh, statutes and regulatory authorities. When particular activities um, are found to injure a marine mammal, we, um, that, we, we uh, mitigate that effect through permits under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We consult around federal activities that will affect an endangered species. And under our, our National Marine Sanctuaries Act, we have similar conversations with other federal agencies who are proposing to do something that we determine and they determine would injure a sanctuary resource. So all of these are, me are mediated not by the NOAA as an agency regulating underwater noise, but instead by us determining each time that a particular type of uh, source of noise will have a particular type effect on a very specific resource. And how do we do that? We go through a process of evaluating uh, the, part, the, the types of noise that this represents, um, whether it is acute and quite loud um, or whether it is more chronic. Those loud noises lead to injury through a different pathway than, through, uh, than those that are more omnipresent in the underwater soundscape. And that's really important as um, to understand uh, relative to how each animal hears. And we think about that as the overlap between animals hearing systems and the particular tones or frequencies that they are attuned to detect. So we wind up with constellations of events um, and places and time periods where animal, animals can be exposed to noise as something that is an immediate threat and something that is more chronic in their environment and is reducing their ability to hear. And the reason, after, especially after um, Pete's description of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, why we really um, uh, hone in on vessels as a concern in many of the National Marine Sanctuaries is because when we line up all the ways that humans introduce noise into the environment with the frequencies or tones that animals hear and the frequencies or tones that animals produce to communicate with one another, and then we make a box around the frequencies produced by vessels, we see the most dominant overlap in the soundscape in between the taxonomic use in the underwater environment and the types of noise produced by vessels. And that noise comes from very um, lots of different sources in a ship or in even a small boat, from machinery to propulsion. And the study of that effect, the introduction of noise from vessels um, on the marine ecosystem is becoming um, a, a real growing body of work. Um, the, the map on the right represents just the studies of marine mammals and vessel noise around the world. And you can see this is an international study space. And when we look at all the studies of underwater noise on marine life, we find that that vessel category is really the largest one. So Noah took a look at all of those statutory authorities, the patchwork quilt, 
and said, we really do need a strategy to sew these together and to better address the more chronic and more cumulative and larger scales effects of things like vessels in the marine environment. And we came up with a strategy that uh, addressed our growing, a growing management portfolio, a growing scientific portfolio, and the need to move the agency towards stronger decision support and outreach. And the prongs that we're really working on now in the last four or five years of this strategy, we're really focused on institutionalize, institutionalizing long-term abilities to monitor sound and providing the public with access to all of that resulting data. We're advancing um, our ability to derive indicators from long-term sound monitoring services that directly answer applied questions. How many users are there in my protected areas? How are they all contributing to background noise? Are the marine animals in my marine protected area responding to climate change? Can we detect shifts in their timing or in their presence associated with shifting climate? How is a damaged or degraded reef that has a very particular sonic signature? Can we see that sonic signature change as it responds to restoration? So there are myriad questions that we're ability that we're able to ask when we store and manage the data from long-term uh, monitoring uh, services well. And the reason for that is that almost all of our questions are about detecting a signal of change. Uh, and you cannot detect a signal of change if you haven't managed an understanding of the variability in your baseline. So all of this wonky data management stuff really is the backbone of our ability to do the next two priorities in this list, which is to really start to derive solid targets for noise pollution that are uh, focused on both the sources of, uh, of noise in partnership with those who directly control them and engaging with partners around the world who are um, evaluating the means to um, set ecologically based targets in different regions focused on different sensitive species and sharing the frameworks um, um, by which we make those policy decisions and how we use science to inform them. And then finally, serving as consultants um, with other US agencies and around the world with partners to incentivize the direct design of quieter design and operations. So focusing really fast on what is online and available for anyone to explore on what it means to monitor in a more standardized long-term way around the country in MPAs and why that's been important to us. We ran a project for three years um, with, uh, with um, co-leadership by the US Navy. This project is now, um, ha has now ended, but the support is for long-term monitoring in national marine sanctuaries is now directly from our program's budget. So this work is continuing. This big group of partners deployed um, underwater sound monitoring in a standardized consistent way in most of our national marine sanctuaries in our system. We then built a portal system and that's what this QR code is for and this URL where you can go and explore all of the sound that resulted from this program. There are uh, several different interconnected portals, some that are focused on education and outreach and others that are focused on data exploration. And they're all linked to a third portal where you can directly download all of the data sets that um, are, uh, were, were created in, in the project. So the first um, portal is where all of our information that we uh, use to educate um, um, the public about the importance of sound underwater and how you go about studying it, and why we're studying the specific aspects of sound, what makes sound in all of our sanctuaries, what are animals in our sanctuaries able to hear. Um, you can hear uh, play sounds from all of the biological and anthropogenic sources that we recorded in each of our sanctuaries around the country. So there's a large portal of about 200 uh, sound clips that you can download and use. We then also um, allow you when you play um, a snippet of one of the biological sources of sound in any sanctuary, this one is Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary on the US West Coast, um, you can then explore 
the uh, temporal or aspects of that sound. So when is that animal calling the most? What do we know about its vocal activity throughout the year in this location? And read about um, uh, that animal's life in that sanctuary. Um, you can then say, well, that's interesting. I was interested in seeing that in Monterey. I'd like to be able to compare it to all the other places where you heard humpback whales. To do that, you click on a link and now you're looking at all of the temporal patterns for all of the humpback whale detections that we made at the scale of the country. For um, so, so jumping, um, just jumping into another couple other features of this, and then I'll move back to the management side. You can um, also explore the times of day that animals call. This is for, um, again, in Monterey Bay, looking at blue whales and the times of day that they're calling. Each of them, you click on them and you're provided with um, a way to access those data and download them directly. So the last tour I wanted to do was through Stellwagen Bank, because I'm going to get to some of the features of this, this, this place. In Stellwagen Bank, you can first learn at a high level about the sanctuary and its soundscape. You can see, um, based on that recorder location in the sanctuary, that pink um, uh, shape represents how far we're able to hear at certain frequencies at any one local recorder location. Helps people understand when we place a recorder on the seafloor what kind of a sampling of that place we are actually doing at lower frequencies. And then you see a really synthetic image of that helps people understand how it is that we take sound, which is of course something we're hearing and make it visual, something we see. This is two to three years of sound and all of its patterns. And at a high level shows you that this is a place that is really dominated by lower frequency sound that comes from vessel activity and also from calling baleen whales that are present um, all, uh, at many times of the year and who are, and are all vocally active. Diving into the portal, you can then take that same data and at any one place, at any one time, get the exact results and the exact measurements. Wagon or the higher tones. And what's really I want to compare Stellwagen's condition to any other sanctuary in the country. Here you're looking at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary down on the U.S. East Coast, a temperate reef environment with Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, which is on the, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, deep water kelp habitat. And you can see they're, they're almost mirror images from each other. And this allows people to quickly understand that one is dominated by a lot of vessel traffic as well going into the port of Seattle. Um, and is a deep water environment. And the other is dominated by snapping shrimp. And you really see that hump of higher frequencies over to the right. All of this ability to compare, and this is, this is um, a snapshot from just a few months ago in May, means that as we continue this work, where Stellwagen continues to do this work, as do many of our other sanctuaries, we can, at any, we can pick any day and look at the soundscape in a complete apples to apples comparison. You can see that Stellwagen again has that farther to the left-hand side hump of noise at lower frequencies, low tones on the piano, dominated by calling whales and by vessel propagation noise versus Gray's Reef, Flower Garden Banks in the Gulf of Mexico, Florida Keys. These are all spaces that are dominated by tropical activity and a lot of um, uh, snapping shrimp in our reef reefier areas. Gray's Reef on any one day that you pick it out, you're able to see calling activity from fish, Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico. Any one day you're able to hear air guns from seismic exploration activity in that region. These snapshots give the program the ability to really comprehensively understand what dominates these soundscapes. So that's all a lot of data. Why do we care? We care because then we can start to derive where are the priorities of the program for understanding and addressing our human implications on these soundscapes. If we just look at vessel noise as an example and drawing from Megan McKenna's work on this, we can look at the very different footprints that we know 
vessels are having in these sanctuaries through automatic identification system data, which is how we track vessels on the surface. And we can see that we know that places have a very different signature of what we call vessel dominance and vessel exceedance. So now we're going from just are there vessels there to how much of the time are they there in the soundscape? How much of the time are they the thing that is driving noise levels in that place higher? There's lots of reasons that noise can be higher in a sanctuary. How much of the time is vessels the thing? And when they are present in the soundscape, how much louder do they make it exceed? We can graph all of that. So in this graph, you're looking at places that range hugely from Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, which has almost no dominance or exceedance from vessel noise, to Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, some places in Channel Islands where noise is um, high a lot of the time. And when it's high, it is, it is driven much higher by vessels. And we can look at that those statistics year round. And when we do that, and we compare very different places, Gray's Reef and Stellwagen Bank, Gray's Reef on the, on the left-hand side here, you can see there is variance throughout the year and how much dominance there is in vessels, but it's always in the negative domain or just a little bit of vessel effect in the summer when there's a lot of research activity. In Stellwagen, there's always a lot of dominance of vessels year round. There's one, time period in March and April, where that dominance is just a little bit less. And we can start to ask the question, why? In Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, there's a seasonal management area where we slow vessels, there are no fisheries, not the sanctuary, but no fisheries, slows vessel down to 10 knots or less if they are 65 feet or greater. And it transits the boundaries of the National Marine Sanctuary and um, includes the lanes that go through the sanctuary into the Port of Boston. This is what the traffic looks like on the right-hand side. And that box, that sort of oblong box on the, on the left-hand side is the seasonal management area. We have hydrophones placed near those lanes, but we very carefully put them not just in the lanes, but near the lanes because those spots are places that we know acoustically as sensitive animals, um, uh, that's important habitat for them. So on the um, right-hand side is an older but fabulous map um, by Mike Thompson at Stellwagen that shows the shift in the lanes that the sanctuary worked on to move that shipping further away from higher density habitat. But there we are in at SBO3, which you can see on the left-hand side, we're listening to an environment that is really important to whales. And we know that from our portal, that tour I just got, uh, gave you, you can go in there and you can plot all of this yourself. You're, you're looking in green at every single time we hear a vessel in Stellwagen. So you can see that, that this is two years of data and you're looking at pretty much every unit of time in those two years, you're hearing a vessel and then you can plot the number of AIS tracked vessels that are within 10 kilometers of the place where we're listening. So a lot of tracked vessels as well in purple. Not every vessel is tracked by AIS. So there's more green than there is purple. And then you can also plot how many times we hear a right whale calling. And right whales are calling in orange the two months that there is a seasonal management slowdown of vessel traffic are marked in red. So you can see that we do, a, you know, the NOAA fisheries rule does a pretty good job of capturing some predictable periods of right whale calling in that area and slowing traffic down. And there's also activity in the winter with right whales calling in that area that is not captured in the two months speed zone. And the data show that indeed vessels are relatively compliant with the speed rule. And you're gonna hear coming up why they're so much more compliant than they are in other places with this rule. But you can track that yes, indeed, the percentage of vessels that are going below 10 knots is pretty high. What we can now do with a hydrophone though, is show you that they are also almost three decibels quieter than they are when they are not slowing down. So during these two months of the time, if we slice and dice the soundscape, 
and look at all the time periods throughout all of the years that vessels are slowing down, we can measure how vessels are when they slow in those two months. And this is, this is for Jess Morton, because I think I saw her name here. When we run these types of programs around the country in a voluntary setting, um, the folks that have been doing that work, like the Protecting Blue Whales and Blue Skies program and the Expanded Sanctuary program on the West Coast, you can measure the amount of co-benefit you get from a, clo co a collision reduction directed program, slowing vessels down in reducing the amount of noise that is also in that whale habitat. Two more points about target setting. Um, we have been working pretty hard around the world at coming up with targets that are flexible as guidance for how much quieter ships can get. So this is NOAA outside of its authorities as an impact manager, um, sitting at the table with folks who directly manage noise sources to try to understand how much quieter can vessels get for all the reasons that we might want them to be quieter. Working at the UN International Maritime Organization, working with classification societies as they define low, medium, and high performance for ships, working with ports, and working with countries who are looking to set targets. I threw, started, I've been very vessel focused today, but we've also been working pretty hard on quieting targets um, for offshore wind piling installation. And the United States Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has been really leading that work, trying to consider what are reasonable targets for quieting um, some of the sources associated with installing offshore wind. Germany has set uh, quite a, a high bar in that department. Ecological targets are all also moving along quite quickly. I always like to remind myself and others that Glacier Bay National Park in the US has a long time ago started a program to uh, limit the amount of cruise shipping that comes in and out of that marine uh, park um, in order to reduce uh, noise disturbance as well as other types of disturbance to humpback whales. The Port of Vancouver's ECHOES program has been really working hard um, beyond their amazing work in the source space to come up with targets for um, killer whale habitat. NOAA now has proposed um, acoustics as part of three critical habitat features for endangered species in U.S. waters, Cook Inlet Beluga, those false killer whales in Hawaii, and right now only proposed um, but being considered is, are the acoustics of rice's whale habitat in the Gulf of Mexico. And finally, there's, you know, the all of you in the European um, area, Europe last year set uh, thresholds for all European waters for exposure limits for impulsive and continuous noise. And we um, enjoy close collaborations with European colleagues as we think about how to implement those measures in ways that are kind of co consistent in the way they use data around the world. I think I'll stop there because I have to. Um, but um, these are at, um, really are starting to be incentivized in, in, in a lot of other frameworks. There is a very large granting program out right now um, to, for the, from the Department of Energy and the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management that is uh, looking to um, help folks uh, come up with quieter designs for offshore wind installation. And I think I saw someone from BOEM on the call today so she can answer questions about that. And the Maritime Administration um, is also pushing forward on quieter designs in the vessel space. In both of these cases, NOAA serves as support and encouragement from the natural resource management perspective. And that is all I had. Thank you very much, Leila, for that. Uh, uh, for that interesting and, and quick overview, I guess, in, in, in the short space of time we have. And again, uh, apologies for having to uh, push you through that. But again, thank you very much, and it's, it's very much appreciated. Um, I'm not sure if you, you can stay on for a few minutes or you, if you have to shoot, but um, I'm sure there'll be some questions here. But I think uh, with the people in the room, I think we can tackle some of those questions um, here as well. But of course, uh, if anybody online with specific questions and um, we can certainly put you in touch with Lena as well. So um, again, thank you very much and wish you all the best for your following meeting. <laughs>
Thank you. And I'm really sorry. Um, and yes, I'd, I'd be more than happy to follow up. Thank you for your understanding. Okay, thank you very much. So um, I guess just what uh, those online may, may be gathering themselves and, and just thinking through what's been discussed, is there any sort of comments or, or points in, in the room, especially from our partners so sort of, that may have experienced sort of managing, uh, managing noise um, or dealt with the, the, the issues that noise can uh, bring to marine mammals? Just a very, very technical question. What kind of recording devices are you using to record noise in the environment? Um, Do we have any staff that can answer that? Uh, sound traps. Which sound traps, okay. Okay, so you are replacing that regularly or something like that? Right, you're at right. three, three months, right? So it's, it's continuously recording them. We switch and mm -hmm. we do a hot swap. So we put one out at the same time we're bringing one in. Okay. Thank you. I wasn't sure if Camilo was still there to answer that or not. <laughs> no, they, they have to jump off. So, so we're on our own for this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, we, so we, have, we have about 10 minutes or so for some discussion before we need to move on to the next topic. So. Um, I'm just I'm just wondering, Jim, from those in the room, we have MPA managers here, and those that have dealt directly with it. Any sort of reflections on 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 how you dealt with noise or experienced noise pollution, not necessarily managed it, or you know how how has noise been seen to affect the area in which you manage or are involved with? Mm -hmm. one of the things that kind of comes up for us a lot um, is, I think we, we kind of touched on this the other day in the renewable energy side of things and the development with that and the noise associated with the construction, but then the operation as well. Um, and I think that's, that's an area that really needs to be looked at because we don't want to be creating this renewable energy source and then at the detriment of other areas of conservation. So, so it's kind of how to find that balance between the two. Um, but again, that's you know, it obviously gets compl quite complicated because you want to have a bit of both. So. And we have an interesting situation here right now where um, there's unusual mortality events going on the entire east coast of the U.S. Uh, for humpback whales, right whales, and, and minke whales, I believe, also. And so there's a lot of people that are saying it's the wind energy sites that are causing all of this. There's really no data to back it up, but it's become really quite controversial as, as people with political different political agendas are taking the, the whale issue suddenly and trying to use that for their particular uh, agenda and put it forward. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting situation right now for that. Yeah. But whales aren't political. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, engineer, and, and and for the benefit of those online as well as part of the the toolkit um, and part of the fact sheets that Ben mentioned earlier at the start. One of the key things that we're going to look at over the next couple of months is developing some resources around renewables, and I think the part of this is now that pull and stretch from both sides that we all say we need renewables, but at one hand we need to be conscious of the impacts that they can that they can cause on marine mammals, but we're also working in conservancy effects as well. So as long as we can provide people with the best knowledge and resources to limit and hopefully manage those the better we can do it. One of the pro projects we're having right now is to, to look at what is the 24 hour sound budget on still lagging based on our, our tagging of, of oils. Um, because we now have GPS locations for the tags, we have AAS so we know what ships are, are moving. Um, so we'll be able to say here's here's an hour by hour um, exposure level to the tagged animals. So that'll be interesting. That's being done by Susan Parks at Syracuse, who's one of our long-term partners, and Dana Cassano, who's um, our postdoc here. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just a question. Um, when ships use their regular jet sounders, is that at a frequency that's comparable to uh, the engines or the cavitation or or is that a different That's frequency? That's usually altogether? a higher higher frequency. And do we find it to yeah. be problematic for fish and cetaceans or that would be a real question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I know there's a lot of thought going into that, um, but I really don't have an answer. Yeah, can I add to that? With uh, death founders and, um, well, yeah, death founders, it's just one beam going down and then back up. But with um, the more expensive, I guess, <clears throat> but more prevalent fish finders, it's um, a spread beam mm -hmm. um, and would tend to have a, a larger uh, spatial impact than the depth sounder. Okay, thank you. And I see. Um, no, go ahead online. Yeah, so if we can just move to uh, Jerome. I see you've got your hand up, so feel free to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I had a, a question. Um, do you guys know in Stellwagen Bank what proportion of uh, of noise does uh, shipping lanes actually represent? Because there, I guess you guys have a lot of traffic with the well watching boats, uh, fishing boats as well. Are they all uh, equipped with the IS? Are they big enough? And do you know what uh, proportion of that uh, ocean, uh, well, actually ship noise does that represent? Um, for the AIS question, I can say that you know our large vessels are all equipped with AIS. Class B is getting more and more popular around here, where it's about uh, one third of their fishing fleet has AIS on it. Um, so not capturing the smaller boats, but certainly the larger boats. Um, we use VMS, a vessel monitoring system, for some of the vessels that are out there that they're only reporting you know every half hour or every hour. So it's not quite able to get us you know close to points of approach and stuff. But gives us some sort of idea where there could be heavier activity. But I think in, in Lila's presentation, she said it's really dominated by the large commercial ships. Mm -hmm. Just add um, another area where we're looking to do some management action is in working with the Coast Guard um, to study vessel traffic and establish other shipping lanes that uh, transect uh, spell wagon to sort of concentrate vessel traffic um, that runs north and south and, and, and northeast, southwest, um, so that it's in areas where there's less bailing whale activity. So that only uh, not only reduces um, uh, ambient noise or anthropogenic noise, it reduces the likelihood of the ship's race. But just looking at the vessel traffic in your MPA, you can, you can really understand and sort of focus and keep some of the, the more random traffic um, out of areas where there's no whales. But the advantage is you guys know where your whaling are. Not all of us know where our whales <laughs> are. Our urban <laughs> in our very lucky. Areas. Um, <laughs> would there be any kind of plans to look at um, noise specifically generated by the whale watching boats themselves? Because obviously they're going to be in closest proximity a lot of the time yeah. to the whales for extended time. That's what this new project is going to do. So here's a, a, a animal tag with a D tag. The whale watching boats do have AAS on them. We have GPS on the, uh, the whale tags now. So we have to say, you know, here's an animal with X number of boats around it. This is the um, size, the footprint for that particular individual at that time. Yeah. So we're moving towards that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's one more question and we need to move on to the next one. So. I was just a comment. I was going to go back to the depth sounder yeah. question. I just looked up the frequency of the average depth sounder, and it's much higher than the communication range of most baleen whales. So it certainly wouldn't affect their communication, whether it affects their hearing, maybe not, but probably not. Much higher than the frequency that they use. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, Maria. Uh, Maria is from University of um, Iceland. Um, and I'm not sure you can answer this, but in your in your bay, um, they use electric powered whale watch vessels. Some of them, anyway, mm -hmm. not all of them. Um, yeah. Do you have a long enough term sound uh, uh, monitoring database to be able to before the electric? Uh, whale watch boat came on the scene and after to detect any trends in 
noise generated by the whale watch fleet. And also, sure, we do have um, sound traps. On, uh, I'm not, it's not continuous recording, but we do have them for long term uh, period. But uh, the thing is, with the electric whaleboats, it's maybe one out of 20 boats. Yeah. So. But there may be more in the future. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, I don't think we, I'm not sure I have to ask yeah. Maria about that. But <laughs> Oh, it's interesting for sure to see yeah. that. Yeah, it would be. I'm not sure in the Canary Islands, I was involved in a study where they they were approaching pilot waves and we were simulating the approach with a petrol engine vessel and then the same vessel had also electric engines, so it was a hybrid. And we would do it once with the petrol engine and then once with the, the electric. And uh, we were recording the behavior and it was like a before and during uh, like treatment and control comparison. And we definitely found that um, there was a decrease in nursing and behavior. It was mother and, and cows. And then, yeah, there was some effect on pilot test, of course. Yeah, so the, the, with the petrol engine. So with the electric, it was definitely like less impact yeah. on this study. Mm -hmm. I don't know about contacts and in Chef Family, but I'll definitely face it with Maria. Yeah. yeah. I thought a lot of it was the cavitation sounds more than the engine sound. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah, I mean, it is, but at lower speeds, um, I think. Yeah. I think cavitation has less of a role in sound generation than just the engine, the uh, transmission of the engine noise itself. Any other bubbles? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, I think the biggest challenge we're going to face today is um, moving on to the next topic because there's so many interesting discussions to have, and I guess we're all passionate in the room, so if we can get uh, get carried away with some excellent points, and I'm sure especially similar to the renewables as well, that you know, now we're hopefully moving more things towards electric and hybrid and understanding the, the impact of those, um, or the lesser impact, hopefully, as we move forward. So um, so we'll, we'll wrap that up on the, on the on the noise pollution side of thing. And again, thank you um, to, uh, to Jerome for the question and everybody in the room, but um, that will bring us nicely onto our second topic where we'll have a look at shit strike. So we'll have some present. We'll have a presentation from David Wiley and Mike Thompson, um, and really also uh, for those in the room, um, looking at the the topics that were the sort of brought up and brought to to face um, during um, the video that we watched earlier of collision. It was, it was great seeing that that video this morning because it really does you know bring in a lot of things that we're going to be talking about mm -hmm. so it's, it's a, a perfect combination anyway i think that's going to work okay. let's try this is forward oh, okay. Good. so mike and i are going to be jointly doing this presentation um we'll see how that works but we're going to be talking about a lot of different stuff so let me first just kind of go over quickly what we're going to talk about so you don't get too lost with all the different things you're going to deal with. Uh, we're going to talk about realignment of the PSS to the sanctuary, as they pointed out in the video, that really it's co-occurrence. When you have lots of ships and lots of whales, you're going to have a ship straight problem. If you can separate those two things, um, that's one of the ways you can mitigate that problem. Uh, we're going to talk about right whale auto detection buoys, which are buoys we have in the sanctuary that will listen for right whales and can tell ships that there's right whales um, in their path, at least if they're in the TSS. Um, going to talk about some work we're doing at Boyd's Hole about detecting with infrared cameras. They were talking about that as well um, on the uh, video this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about our right well corporate responsibility uh, project. This is what Mike's going to talk about. It's really been the driving force behind that. Um, this is a project to really increase compliance with the seasonal management areas, which NOAA has created to make sure that whales, or excuse me, that that will slow down in the seasonal management areas that are created to protect right whales. Uh, they're going to talk a little about the underwater behavior of large whales and whale alert, which is a program that we have 
uh, again, to help uh, increase compliance with uh, some of the management areas for right whales in particular, and then using dimethyl sulfide uh, as a tool for trying to figure out where right whales might aggregate. So that's your little list of things um, that we're going to be covering. And each one of those talks could be an hour. So <laughs> you're going to get a kind of a very, very brief overview of them. As we said, um, still wagon is really, really heavily populated by both whales and ships. So when I first worked here, came here about 20 years ago, we were really a hot spot for whales getting hit by boats. Um, then I recruited Mike uh, after I got here, and the two of us really took that on as, as a major uh, project for us to try to mitigate. This is a bunch of the, the ships you see zipping by over on the right-hand side. You get the idea. They're just ships all the time here in Stellwagen. You got that from Lila's uh, presentation as well, which is, you know, we're one of the loudest sanctuaries um, in the country because of all the ship traffic. So you're talking about we're lucky enough to know where our whales are. This is because we have a pretty good big uh, whale watching operation here with 15 boats sometimes operating. And most of those actually collect data on whale sightings. So we took those uh, those data and Mike gridded off the sanctuary and then um, made this nice little graphic showing us where the whales were with obviously the red and the higher density uh, and the yellow and lower density, blue and very low densities. And then you can see the shipping lanes uh, that went right through the very highest densities. So that's a really a recipe for uh, whale strikes, but it also gave us the idea that um, we can actually mitigate that uh, if we change things a little bit. So this is the same data creeped a little bit differently, red being high, blue being low. And again, you can see the TSS in the earlier days went right through the highest densities. And the idea um, was, wow, maybe we should move the TSS to lower density areas. So that's what we did. Uh, we worked a lot with the um, Boston uh, shipping community. Probably most of you have what we call here port operator groups, uh, but most really large areas have a place where all the maritime industry gets together to talk about their issues. So I would go up to that uh, group and I'd get, make a presentation. They'd ask questions. Mike and I would come back and work up the data. I'd go back the next month and give the presentation again with the new data. They'd ask more questions. So we went back and forth of this for about six months. Uh, one, they could see we were going to actually come back every month, so they couldn't just ignore us. Um, and two, uh, because of Mike's work, we were able to actually identify and, and ask, answer almost all the questions that they had. Um, so they actually were the ones that helped us come up with these particular um, routes through. So here, looking at the um, different species of whales, over here in the uh, right-hand side, and we looked at what the reductions were, um, about an 81% um, reduction in risk uh, baseline co-occurrence if we move the, the uh, TSS from the old one to this new one coming through uh, that gap that I showed you in that earlier um, picture. And this is Mike's great map on the left. Uh, again, co-occurrence reduced by 81% for all whales and 58% for right whales. The white dots that you're seeing there are the right whale sightings. So right whales are always a priority for us because they are, are so critically endangered, but really all whale species, um, particularly for your national sanctuary, need attention. So this was a, a good example of something that, that was um, very important for us in the early days. That purple area that you're seeing here, as we were doing this, um, the energy people in the United States said, well, you know, we want to get LNG uh, areas off of land and put them onto the ocean. It's safer there. So they decided they were going to put this LNG port right next to our sanctuary. And we said, wait a minute. And we just moved that TSS to reduce the risk of ship strikes. And you get up in the biggest, fastest ships possible through here. We really have to do something to mitigate that. So we worked with the Coast Guard um, to create a system of acoustic buoys. We were also lucky enough to know Chris Clark. And we were already collaborating with Chris on a bunch of different things. And so he was doing these uh, real-time buoys. He had one. And so he said, well, what we need is a bunch of those. So luckily, the Coast Guard, in terms of their licensing agreement, said to the uh, energy companies, you have to create the system of acoustic buoys to the sanctuary um, for it to license you. And that was to the tune of about $40 million. And the way this works is there's acoustic buoys to the sanctuary. Each one of them has a hydrophone with uh, some automatic detection algorithms on it. And that listens for a particular call, the right will up call, and it goes, Whoa. and when it hears that, it goes up to a uranium link, uh, to a satellite, and then down the 
people like Cornell um, identify it as truly a red whale cough, and then it's pumped out to the, uh, the maritime industry. Another thing we're working on with Woods Hole, Dan Sitterbart, is the infrared cameras. And this is really working out surprisingly well. I didn't think it was going to work out as well as it did. Um, but we can actually identify these things at a pretty good distance um, in day or night. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that you have to worry about if boats have this and they're saying, oh, we've got this, we don't have to do anything else because we have these great cameras on board. Unless you can make sure you tie that to their behavioral change, um, you have to worry about that you're actually not solving the problem for whales. You're actually solving the problem for the, for the maritime community. So those are always a concern. Again, um, hard to verify some things that you try to do, such as infrared cameras. And one of the real problems that we uh, learned about from working with maritime industry is unpredictability. So everybody thinks it'd be great to have these real-time systems uh, that say, oh, there's a whale there, you just slow down. But for the maritime industry, that's really hard uh, because they need predictability. So they've got all this infrastructure waiting on shore. If that is uh, left waiting, that's very costly. It's actually more convenient for them to go slow and be predictable than it is to have the, all these real-time things popping up in front of them. And the accelerator energy people said, were the ones that um, funded the, uh, the acoustic buoys, said, uh, if we had known they were going to be lit, lit up so much, we would have just saved the money and just slowed down to 10 knots all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they should have. So corporate responsibility, there you go, Mike. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Thompson. I'm a geographer, a GIS analyst here at the Sanctuary. So lucky enough to be working with Dave for the past well, 20 some odd years. So um, today I'm going to just give a brief update on what we do for our right whale corporate responsibility project. Uh, we've been running this project since you know about 2018, uh, where it's been a corporate responsibility versus just sending out report cards to ships. So I'll tell you a little bit more about it here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the NOAA right wheel rules, but the uh, seasonal management area rules is part of the NOAA suite of rules to slow down ships to 10 knots during times that right wheels are present. We have two areas that overlap the sanctuary, the Cape Cod Bay and the Off Race Point. Um, and this all went into effect about 2009, which is around the same time that we started um, recording via AIS all the vessel traffic. So what we do here is try to make this an outreach and education project to uh, really put some responsibility back on these big corporations and really give them some sort of ethics to try to reach out for corporate responsibility is a big buzzword here in the US. And the hopes of the project is to increase the vessel compliance with the NOAA's trip strike rule, while at the same time recognizing the achievements of vessels who are actually uh, abiding by the rules and trying to do the right thing. And at the same time, hopefully provide protection to the critically endangered right bill. Um, so me as a GIS person, a mapping person, first thing we do is we get, you know, the 150 million uh, data points in of AIS that come in every year to the sanctuary. Um, I go ahead and turn them into uh, line transits and then break out each little line segment into whether or not they're going under 10 knots, you know, that 10 to 11 knots sort of safe speeds and safer speed zone, and then that uh, anything above 11 knots to non-compliant. So you can see all the transits uh, day by day on the right. Uh, for this past year, this is 2022 data. And... Um, Right after that, we go through and we create, because everybody likes getting report cards, we give a report card to every vessel. So uh, what uh, each vessel will get will be uh, a map of all the areas that they transited within the SMA with lines showing how much uh, distance was traveled and whether it was compliant or not compliant. And then down at the bottom here, you have a, a bar chart showing you know total distance traveled within and without a compliance. Uh, and then we also tell them how many transits they had, how many distance they traveled, and how much of the time they were out of had we're in or out of overall compliance. One of the more neat factors that we do is we'll take their least compliant transit and bring it over to the side and we take it and we recalculate that and say, okay, well, if that's traveling at 10 knots and you actually slow down, how much time would that actually take you? So we can take their least amount, the least compliant transit here and see that in most cases it's between 10 and 20 minutes. So this is a good example of one that would slow down. So not a lot of time, especially for a lot of these ships that you know might be coming from you know overseas uh, sending long long transit. So um, after that, we go through and we have our special grading system that we do to give everybody you know the appropriate sort of uh, of grades. Uh, in particular, vessels that get A's and A pluses, uh, we have a certificate that's signed by by B. Decole, our superintendent, and also uh, Patrick Romage from the uh, International Fund for Animal Welfare, 
there's been different people in, involved over the years, but this is our latest one. Um, very cool little plaque that goes out to them. And this year we had 305 vessel report cards, and of that, 274 of those vessels got vessel certificates, so pretty good. And uh, that's 206 companies that own all those vessels, um, and pretty similar uh, results there. There you can see a bunch of packages that I'll talk about and what they get in a little bit. Um, the main point of this, though, is that I think it's a really successful project. Um, you know, since Dave first came up with this idea, and, uh, we instituted it. It started off with low ish compliance and started moving up to now where you know 90% of the vessels are traveling and uh, compliant of the SMAs. Um, similar with the companies. We can look at it a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and as Dave said, it's talk could go on for hours and hours just looking at data because we're all, we all love our data. Um, but we can break it all up by vessel types and all by grades and look at that at just looking at more important things like uh, tankers and uh, cargo ships, which are larger and vassal vessels, most likely of um, killing whales, um, are the ones that are actually slowing down the most. So it's a really successful um, sort of project. This is looking at it since we started the project in 2018, moving forward to now. Um, you know, the you can see the red kind of go up and down just a little bit, a little bit, but most of the time it's it's all up around that you know high 80, 90 percent um, uh, A to A plus compliance. Um, and an important thing to note there is that uh, forty eight percent of the vessels were first new time vessels that came in uh, to the sanctuary. So it, it's, it, it always surprises me when I do this every year and looking up all these vessels that you know we get a lot of new boats that have never entered an SMA. Um, so that's important to remember. And in, in this case, we had, you know, 100% of our Fs were all vessels that had never been through before. So they'd never been part of our corporate responsibility program. And of that, some of the um, uh, new time vessels, though, at the same time, uh, also got A's. Um, so which means that eh, maybe they're hearing it through the rumor mill that uh, this is a successful project. Um, so every vessel gets a... Uh, Corporate Responsibility Project, sort of two-page summary signed by Pete and the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And we also had our partners at NOAA Fisheries on board uh, for this. And if the company deserves it, they get a company certificate, um, if they deserve. And But every vessel gets a report card, and then each vessel also gets a certificate if they deserve it as well, so they can hang it up on their wall. Um, and then we describe how we do some of the grading because we give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. For example, they come through the Cape Cod Canal and they go an extra two knots for pushing through the current for five minutes over, you know, two hour transit. We give them a little bit of a buffer room there. Um, and then a pamphlet that talks about whale alert, which we'll talk about next. So uh, it's really neat. I mean, I've been doing GIS work for years and we've been going to lots of meetings like this, but it's really, really fun to send something out like a report card and then get responses back, not only from companies, but lawyers uh, and uh, <laughs> captains, um, lots and lots of emails, lots and lots of uh, faxes, Dave gets lots of calls, Pete gets lots of calls. Um, they range from everywhere from, hey, we want to thank you for the certificate, we're very proud of this recognition, to, oh, okay, in this one time, you know, we're speeding a little bit, we'll look into it, um, to, okay, yep, I, I hear you, we failed to observe the right bill, SMA, and we're going to take immediate steps, and uh, we're really sorry. Um, you know, uh, please don't please don't get us in trouble. <laughs> um, hoping that you get sound on this, but maybe not. Okay. On this recording. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's not. It, no sound's going to play out of this. You don't think you're in there? It should be. If not, I can. But well, sorry, I would say this is one of my more fun. Uh, uh, Recordings that we got left us voicemail from um, uh, being from Boston. It was kind of fun getting a phone call from somebody from New York with this very deep New Yorker accent saying, oh, we, I just got your package, but one of our vessels didn't get a certificate. Could you mind sending that to us? And of course, they didn't deserve the certificate. So um, it was a really uh, successful sort of feedback loop that we were getting. It's very rare for us to kind of institute some sort of um, conservation and then actually hear back um, from people saying, we're listening. Um, we know that you're watching and that, yes, we are interested in, in continuing to follow this. Um, NOAA Fisheries has also done a similar thing where they look at this data because we only look at the data here in Stellag and in the area around Massachusetts. Um, but it shows that our corporate responsibility project seems to be really working a lot better than in other parts of the country um, as we uh, have the highest compliance um, in Cape Cod Bay and Race Point. And then similarly looking at it, the least amount of compliance I had the lowest level of non compliant vessels across all the SMAs up and down the East Coast. So I really do think that's a good metric. But I think our best metric that we have is that the trade journals, like the large shipping company, Liger, 
um, actually is putting it into their uh, journals as, you know, they're trying to shame everybody else by saying, hey, look, we're doing this. You guys should be doing this too. And um, they even put a, a QR code to link about right whales and talk about how they receive certificates. So we look at this as a really good successful project. Um, one of the pieces of that package that uh, goes out to everybody also tells them about whale alert. So I'm sure you've heard a lot about whale alert from Ben over the past few days, but it has not. <laughs> Um, there's this is our, our real time uh, app that helps uh, raise awareness uh, to vessels around right whales in particular, but also other marine mammals. Um, the idea of whale alert is that it's there's a lot of information if you're a boater if you're paying attention to right whales. Um, I had a look on five different websites just to figure out what's going on. NOAA has a lot of good rules that are trying to help. This year is supposed to be the one stop shop for all that information to be there. So we can hopefully increase the whale conservation and, and also get um, more information out there. Uh, it's free to download on Google Play, App Store. Um, there's also some Windows phone versions available. I just pulled this up um, the other day because I didn't have the data and I thought it was interesting, but this is these are all the dynamic management areas, seasonal management areas uh, over the past five years um, up and down the East Coast. So it was, it was interesting for me to see. Um, <clears throat> And those blue circles are areas where there's particular ways to get messages out to ships. So there's some gaps in there too. So there's a lot to pay attention to if you're a boater. Um, we have lots of partners. This list is a lot larger and larger. I should say it's everywhere here in the, uh, um, the U.S., also in Canada and parts of the Mediterranean. Now I think yeah. See um, And uh, we have over 300,000 downloads. It's probably more like 500,000 since it's been you know another year since I looked up that number. So a good amount of users using it. Um, Dave and I did a lot of work uh, originally working with these port operator groups and going in to work with the large ships coming in and out of Boston terminals um, and getting on the bridges of the ships and showing them how well alert works, um, including, you know, some of our larger, you know, rural row boats, our big car carrier boats and going right up to the captains and talking to them and like any lines have to be one of the bigger ones here on the East Coast. Um, but more importantly, we're working with our, all of our partners, the, pilot, the Boston Harbor Pilots Association, the pilots up and down the West east and west coast talking to uh, vessels as they're coming in and out of port to show them that they can use whale alert to get the most up-to-date information and even our aerial survey teams in the coast guard are using it for uh, reporting sightings which is something that you can do as well um, uh, general public can report or if you're a qualified uh, observer you can uh, report live dead where it's all geo located and then we have a QAQ system that just goes through, you know, the writing, uh, the right whale advisory system. But it's not just limited to right whales and um, a lot more to this program. If you haven't already downloaded, I recommend you download it soon. Um, and then to end, I know you're not all probably fans of American football, but maybe you are Tom Brady. I can say that a few years ago, Apple actually used, uh, used us on their commercial for all of uh, during the Patriots championship game. So it was on the Patriots football game. And here we showed up for... Wait two seconds now. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but, but I think you, you, you figured out 22 seconds with like 5 million people. That That's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
So we had that in theory. So how did this work? Uh, here you're looking at the tracks of, of the authors moving around Cape Cod Bay. So these are the tracks. And then you'll see the colored blobs. And those colored blobs are really how much dimethyl sulfide is there. So red being lots of dimethyl sulfide, um, you know, the, the black and the blue being much less dimethyl sulfide. And I don't know if you can see it all the way back there, but basically all these X's are where right whales are sighted either on our cruise or the Center for Coastal Studies is flying at the same time we're doing this. And so we plotted their sightings of right whales on our dimethyl sulfide map. And basically the right whales are in the highest areas of dimethyl sulfide. So we also uh, had money from BOEM to uh, tag say whales because they can tag very rarely. Um, so, but they're also copepod feeders. So we said, ah, oh, let's put the dimethyl sulfide machine on over tagging say whales. And that's this northern part here. And again, if you look closely, you can see all these X's which have the say whale sightings and they're also in the highest dimethyl sulfide levels. Oops, wait a second. And then our colleagues at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center uh, we put Liam, our, our tech, on board with the dimethyl sulfide when they were doing right well work south of, of Cape Cod. And again, you're seeing the exact same pattern. Um, no right whales, no right whales, lots of dimethyl sulfide, and all of these are right whales. So again, two different areas, two different species, all showing this association of, of right whales or in say whales, copepod feeding whales um, with high levels of dimethyl sulfide. Um, this is just us tagging say whales. We've always tagged things with poles on the left. Uh, we've been working with Ocean Alliance uh, to tag with drones, which really turns out to be a great way to place suction cup tags on large whales. I wasn't looking at the tag one yet. Uh, it seems to be my animated get is looping to the scan. So I'm sorry about that. Well, anyway, <laughs> it works well. We showed it before. We showed it right. before. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Down. Good. Okay. So basically the relevance to management, you know, is that the problem with um, passive acoustics and aerial surveys is that when the right whales are there, all they do is say, hey, the right whales are here. There's no ability to, to warn people beforehand, say, hey, things, things are starting to uh, produce a situation where right whales are likely to show up. So we're looking at dimethyl sulfide as really the way to do that. Um, so you can do that for wind energy, uh, for ship strikes, for entanglements, you know, all sorts of ways of uh, diminishing the risk by figuring out where right whales are going to be located in, in this case, uh, say whales as well. Okay. That's supposed to be a video too. <laughs> anyway, so there's one of our right whales. And that's our super strike presentation. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh... A lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, I try to talk fast. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you very much. And um, so we have about uh, 15 minutes or so for a take a little break before we, before we carry on. But um, well, again, whilst we wait for people to gather themselves online, any, anybody uh, have any questions in the room for uh, David and Mike? Francis? I'm, I'm not online, but uh, question. And you may have said it. Sorry, I have to step out of the room. But did the new TSA have an impact on the travel time of the ship? Yes, um, that was one of the things we, when we moved, worked with them, we did all these different calculations and Mike did a great thing and how long we take them to do, go through these different possibilities. And the one that they chose was 12 to 22 minutes extra, depending on how fast they were traveling. Okay, which, which is nothing if they're coming from like Quest of Asia oh, or, okay. Right. So, okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, um, so we just saw the documentary Collision um, about the worldwide ship strike problem. And I'm just wondering if you think your efforts here had an, had an impact um, uh, around the world uh, for these other efforts. Um, not that they would do the same thing, but you know, do you think you influenced their um, their mitigation efforts. Sure, it, it's a small community. I, I knew everybody there personally, right? So we've shared stories back and forth, just like sharing stories here today. So, you know, that, that's a great way of, of moving forward is by getting everybody together and, and just talking about things and sharing experiences. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
that's what I like about this Marine Mammals 20 is that, you know, I and now you and Mike and everybody else can interact with this international community and um, share lessons learned and success stories and what's not working. Yeah. Perfect. And just on that point as well, I know you talk a lot about success stories, but I think, as you mentioned, Ben, it's really important to talk about where it hasn't worked or failures. We need to not be scared of talking about failures because uh, uh, and said, you mentioned a lot of money in some places and what you mentioned, you know, the amount of money needed, if we can prevent those failures reoccurring and spend them, put that money into R and D into new things that may have more successes, and it's the benefit because we don't have a lot of time. Let's be honest. Yeah, I think that's really important. Is that you know we don't like to talk about failures um, because for the, they're embarrassing or, or whatever. But yet, if you don't, then people are because you did whatever you did that failed was logical to do at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't say we tried this and it didn't work and this is why, then people are bound to repeat the same thing again because it was a logical way to move forward. You were saying there was a lot of back and forth going with the, the shipping companies in terms of getting the, the um, moving the shipping lanes and things like that. Did you also do kind of like education programs with the, the captains and, and other mariners at the same time? Oh, oh absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I would, well, I would just do whale talks. Mm -hmm. So they got kind of used to me and we actually had a pretty good relationship um, because when we went to the IMO um, with the TSS ship, you know, they were supporting it at that point. They're going, yes. You know, at first I said, well, you know, if you guys, you guys are just not going to work against it. And they're going, well, what do you mean? We're going to, we're going to work for it. You know, so it, it worked out really well. And whale alert, part of the reason for whale alert um, came from them because when we, when we, the NOAA started these seasonal management areas, you know, they said, why are you? You're not an idiot. What do you think? There, there's no lines in the water up there. You know, how are we going to do this? Of course, they want you to say, yes, that's a dumb idea. I said, well, let's see if we can help you. And so that's how we divide whale work. Yeah. And then they said, well, why aren't we uh, producing? Why aren't we allowed to give you sightings? So then we added that to whale work. Okay, now you can use it as a citizen sightings tool and, and report sightings. But a lot of that stuff was back and forth with that community yeah. um, that we had a very good working relationship with now. How long did that kind of process take? Oh, yeah. well, six, six months, really. You know, That's not that bad, yeah. but the, you know, the first times I went up, I was really, um, I'm kind of castigated, <laughs> you know, because basically, um, you know, the first idea is if there means you to go away, you know, so you have to show them you're next, and the same thing with fishermen, mm -hmm. you've got to show them that you're not going to go away. So by going back month after month after month, not only did we have new information for them, but they could see that we weren't going to go away. So, you know, might as well start working with us. And same thing, you know, you, you make a presentation, you don't leave, you stay until the end. And I, I always make it my habit to be the last person that leaves. You know, so, they, you know, there, there's there's a lot that goes into that. There's, um, you know, so they, they don't think they could ignore you and make, make you go away. That's what the effort is. Right. It's not always comfortable. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, the process for actually shifting the lane didn't take six months. No. Dave's okay. work with the port operators yeah. and right. was six months or so six until they came up with agreement of where we wanted to be located. Yeah. Um, then it went to the IMO. Well, it had to go through NOAA, had to go to the Department of Commerce, um, then to the IMO. Um, luckily, we had uh, Lindy Johnson was still alive then, and she was really the powerhouse making it go through there. Um, and that whole process only took like two years. Which you know for policy is like nothing, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. I, I have another question. Um, uh, uh, I am very interesting about the dimethyl sulfate detection. Mm, yeah. Uh, very very interesting. Um. So well. Um. When when you decide to to make um uh, to make the detection. For, uh, how do you choose the, the frequency of the detection? Is there something uh, uh, to help you to decide where uh, it's now, where we're going to it, it, the, it, the, the machine, for the DMS machine, just gives you a, a number every seven minutes. And so basically oh. what we're, we're doing, the way we started it, is because we didn't have any money for it, but we had money for, um, for the infrared camera stuff. And 
So basically from infrared camera, you're trying to come up with a detection curve. So you find right whales and you go towards them and then you go past them and then you come back towards them again. Um, and it was the same thing that we needed for the dimethyl sulfide. So we were able to say, you know, in, in the area where the whales were, there was a lot of high dimethyl sulfide. And then you move away and we decrease and then it would come, you come back to them and it would increase and you go away from them and it would decrease. Um, so, you know, basically that's, that's the uh, methodology for that right now. What we really need to do to move forward though, uh, to make it a real uh, management tool is to be able to do it from space. We need to be able to remote sense dimethyl sulfide. So we're working with some people from Harvard to try to come up with a way to do that. Um, they, you may have seen a thing like last month that uh, the Webb telescope was able to detect the dimethyl sulfide 120 years, uh, light years away in some planet. Um, so I don't know how, I mean, we've been talking with them on how they did it, but you know, they're not going to turn the Webb telescope on to Cape Cod Bay. <laughs> but, but, but the good thing is that um, it's also a climate gas. So people have remotely sensed dimethyl sulfide, but not at the scales that we need, like these giant scales. Um, but nobody's really had um, the data that we have and the scale that we have to train something with. So now you know we can work with these guys from Harvard, people from Harvard, um, to say, here is a map of dimethyl sulfide on this particular day, um, and you know, at this particular scale. And so they'll be able to say, can they find either a direct measurement or is there something that they can find that correlates with that? Um, but then we can then say, okay, let's try this in other areas. For instance, um, you know, the Bay of Fundy they were talking about on the other movie that you know, the right whales left Bay of Fundy and went to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Well, what was the dimethyl sulfide signature in the Bay of Fundy as they left? And what was it up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence as they were moving there? You know, so that, that's the kind of thing we're trying to move towards. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it right now. Yeah, we, when we first were measuring it, you know, we just waiting for, for the data to come back, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it worked out. Can we imagine? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I have something, too. So every, ever since I've been here, um, 21 years, and um, every May, um, the right whales leave. And I, I've noticed that they leave en masse, as in they all leave together at about the same time. And I wonder why, how can they possibly do that? Are they communicating with each other? Well, maybe they're smelling the lack of DMS. Dimethyl sulfide, yeah, and saying, "Oh, copepods are gone. We're out of here." <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one, one of the things you're trying to move towards, uh, possibly with the auk um, this winter, uh, is starting to standardize transects through Cape Cod Bay every week, and so now we'll be able to look at what the, um, you know, what a continuum is of dimethyl sulfide, and when right whales move in and when they move out. You know, is there a threshold? That signifies this is a and, and Stormy Mayo has done things with copepods that there's a threshold that, that right whales like you know they'll start uh, aggregating when when copepod densities get to a particular level so down dimethyl sulfide um, is a proxy for that which it looks like it might be you know then then you know can we use that particularly if we can figure out a way to remote sense it so it's a uh, it's a, a good potential tool. Do you know if anyone's doing something similar with something here? We are the only ones with this particular instrument. Right. All the other instruments are huge and collect data at a much um, longer much time scale. Yeah. So, but but definitely, I think that as as uh, we haven't published this yet, mm -hmm. um, but as this starts coming out, I think there's going to be a lot of interest in it. Yeah. Is We're looking for funding if anybody has. <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. Is it an expensive instrument? It's not a super expensive instrument, um, but obviously all the things that go with it is like any other field project, mm -hmm. right? It just takes money to run a field project, particularly if we're going to try to do it for two months, um, you know, to try to look at this threshold. You know, right now we think we've really fairly well established that, that rate whales are in the, the higher DMS areas. Mm -hmm. And, and, and potentially, we only did a one year with say whales. But. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't see any questions on online. So, um, so 
I'll take the opportunity again. Thanks for the for the presentation, all the brilliant information. The DMS is really interesting, and look forward to seeing some of the advancements um, in the coming years, or hopefully in months. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so I'll take the opportunity to um, to just uh, maybe let's pause for for ten minutes or so, uh, give the chance for people to um, get some fresh air, and anybody online to to grab a copy. I'm kind of sure it's late with where some of you uh, will be joining from. So um, if we take 10 minutes, so that brings us, so that'll bring us back here at 25 past. Um, and then uh, we're back on track um, to move into entanglement. And Dave will be speaking to us again for some uh, exciting information. So thanks very much. And see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, so welcome back. Hope everybody online managed to, to get some fresh air or grab some grab some coffee. I know all of us did here, and as we're just filtering back in the room, we'll um, we'll get started. So um, we'll move on to our next, which is entanglement. Perfect. So David, over to you again. Okay, you're tired of me already. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, you know, the, the video that we saw in the presentation we just did was talking about the co occurrence between ships and whales uh, being the recipe for whale strikes. And it's the same thing with, with entanglement, right? If you have lots of whales and lots of fishing gear, you're going to likely have, have entanglement issues. Uh, the map on the left is, is looking at entanglement sighting or sightings of entangled animals in the sanctuary. Our Still Wagon Sanctuary is this polygon that you're seeing there, uh, kind of right in between Cape Cod and areas to the north. And all those dots are where um, entangled whales were sighted. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that um, because whales can tow gear long, long ways, just because you sighted an entangled whale doesn't mean that it was entangled there. Uh, but while this is going on also, uh, we are doing standardized transect surveys of the sanctuary um, every month, counting whales and fixed gear buoys. So the map on the right is looking at um, whale sightings, which are in red, and all the green dots you're seeing are fixed gear buoys over the course of the year. So then we took those and we developed a metric we call the relative interaction potential, or RIP. Uh, and so then we could look at that and we bin them in, into um, Quaha into, into four different bins. And the dark ones, obviously, are the ones that are going to have the highest uh, relative interaction potential. So we had particular areas of the sanctuary that we knew had lots of gear and also had lots of whales. And if we look at uh, whales, some of the Center for Coastal Studies uh, were working to disentangle whales. Those are the yellow areas that you're seeing, the yellow um, dots that you're seeing. So the entangled animals that were being seen were also being seen where there is lots of gear and lots of whales. So uh, we certainly have reasons to believe that the whales were becoming entangled in the sanctuary. And these are the, the two main gear types, um, fixed gear, uh, gill nets on the top, uh, lobster gear on the bottom. And again, these things are, are sitting on the bottom, uh, bottom fixed gear. Gill nets are going up maybe three meters into the water column. They'll be 30, uh, probably 3,000 meters in length running along the bottom. Um, the lobster trawls that you're seeing on the bottom, uh, again, you'll have sometimes 20 uh, lobster traps lined up in a row um, in a particular um, configuration. So, you know, but then also during the day, they'll go back um, in lots of whale, lots of fishing gear, lots of food right down along the bottom. So, we were tagging whales uh, to see what they were actually doing. These uh, they are for D tags. And we had a friend of ours, Colin Ware, who created this great um, uh, software program called TrackPlot that took the DTAG data and made a ribbon track so we could really see what the animals were doing. And here you can see um, the animals are on the surface. That's that flat top on the bottom, or excuse me, on the top. Then they're diving down and into the bottom. And when they're on the bottom, they're rolling into these folds. Here you see these folds here, 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 and here. And basically, that's the body, bottom or the body orientation were on the bottom. So basically, they were going down, turning on their sides, and moving along the bottom, which, of course, is where all the fixed gear is. So this is, we also use cats tags. Uh, those are video tags. So uh, this you're right now riding on the back of a whale. Here's another whale. And there's another whale. So the three of them are basically going head to head, based, uh, driving sand lance into each other's mouths. And again, all this is taking place on the bottom where the gear is. Uh, this is particularly a prevalent behavior at night. 
Uh, so they're down there at the night, they can't see anything, but there's lots of deer down there uh, at the same time that they're trying to forage on sand lamps. That's not going to work. So, so basically, humpback whales, fin whales, and minke whales, not right whales, um, are here in big numbers. There's lots of fixed deer, and they're on the bottom because that's where their food is. So there's a lot of interaction potential there. Now, we don't have any, um, any particular jurisdiction over entangled whales. So we have to work with our partners, the National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, National Marine Fisher Fishery Service has uh, something called the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Team. And this is uh, a system where they bring all sorts of stakeholders together. These are the different uh, stakeholders and numbers of people on this team. So you can see trap pot fishery. There's 18 fishermen that are part of the, uh, the group, uh, five gillnet fishermen, et cetera, et cetera. 61 people all together. And the idea of this is you're supposed to come up with a consensus agreement on how to solve the entanglement issue. So take reduction team started in 1995. And they're still going on today. So have we solved the issue? We have not. But it doesn't mean we're giving up. So a lot of things are going on to try to solve it. The real focus of the, of the TRT, take reduction team TRT, is North Atlantic right whales because of that critically endangered status they have. But it also is supposed to help uh, humpback fin whales and, and even minke whales. And if you want to find out more, that's the... Um, that's the URL for more about the take reduction teams. Now, one of the things you saw the pictures that I had of the uh, lobster gear with line floating up between the traps. So that was seen as a, a real um, hazard. And the idea is if you can actually use sinking line that would remove some of the water, um, the gear from the water column. So back in 2000, 2005, 2004, 2005, um, there was this big push on to try to get that gear, um, that floating line out of the water, replace it with sinking line. Uh, the idea again being uh, to put it on the bottom where it's going to be less likely to capture whales. And that was really highly successful in, in terms of fishermen coming in, um, turning in their floating line, poly line, and getting a voucher for, for sinking line. Um, so there was a lot of changing from the floating line to the sinking line. It hasn't been statistically proven to actually have been successful, um, but it still seems to be it should, should have been an improvement. One of the problems is if things are rare, it's always hard to statistically prove them. Now, one of the other things that has been really helpful for the, um, the take reduction team is a decision support tool being made by Duke University. Um, that were led by Pat Halpin and, and Jason Robards and their team. And this looks at um, where the whales are, it looks at where the gear density gear is, where gear density is, severity of a particular type of gear, and uses that to come up with a risk metric. And then it plots that spatially over the area that we're working with. And the idea then is that you can target your uh, management actions to where they're going to have the most benefit um, and the least, um, the least cost for, for the fishing community. And, and that's been one of the big, what they call it the decision support tool, because really that's what it does. You know, we look at that and we try to figure out how things should, should um, work so that this is an area where you have to have a lot of management action. This is an area maybe that doesn't need so much management action. The, the thing is, is that um, right whales are moving around all the time, as you guys know, uh, fishermen move around all the time and there's just lots and lots of gear. Uh, you know, I was showing you humpback whales uh, on the bottom. Uh, Mike and I did a calculation using our DPEG data. They spend about 22% of their time within five meters of the bottom. Of course, they spend 100% of their time in the water column, which is where the lines going from the bottom to the top are the vertical lines. So right now, vertical lines are really seen as the biggest threat um, to, to all large whales in terms of entanglement. So how to deal with that is a real question. Um, the, um, there's a bunch of different groups. There's a whole ropeless consortium run by Mark Baumgartner and Michael um, Moore at Woods Hole, and they're really pushing this on-demand fishing gear. Basically, it's a way of, of having, of, well, you know, everybody that does oceanographic research uh, uses this technique already, right? So you have all your stuff on the bottom, you come up with an acoustic link, or there's an acoustic link there, you trigger it, and the float comes up, and that's how you retrieve your gear. So the idea is that's how the fishing community could also work. 
And in theory, it, it should be quite possible. Um, there's a bunch of different um, um, industry players that are coming up with different ways of doing it, but it's all expensive. And since fishermen have lots of gear out there, um, if, if it costs $3,000 for a piece of equipment and you need you know, several hundred of those, um, that gets really expensive really fast. So right now that's, you know, technologically it, it's fairly possible, um, but economically it's really not possible, at least, at least uh, under present conditions. Because of course lobstermen are just small people, small, small, economically small people. Each one is a family business practically. So where you're working with the shippers and you can say, well, you know, you might lose, you know, X number of dollars. And, you know, that's kind of a cost of doing business uh, for an individual lobsterman you know, that X can really put them out of business. So it's a, it's a really difficult situation right now. But this is where we have to go to, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. It's also, we were talking about politics, it's also extremely um, politically difficult because, of course, all, all these fishermen are working in a way that they think is the best way that they can. They, they've done it for years, they've done it for generations. So to tell them this is a better way for them to fish, that's really not working so well. Um, so uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service came up with a rule that said vertical lines have to be taken out of the water, and then a federal judge decided that really uh, that rule wasn't legitimate and has pulled back on the rule. So we'll have to see what, what happens with that. Um, one of the ways you can uh, make things less onerous is by changing, uh, reducing this, the scale of the management actions in both time and area. So one of the things we've been working on, and Pam is gonna talk about this, um, because this is a paper that she led, is using our, uh, well, we haven't even talked about our bird research, uh, but we've had a, a very large project here tagging shearwaters and satellite tags to see where they, they go. And some of them have been to France lately and um, other places. They move around a lot, um, but Pam, this is you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So as Dave mentioned, one possible solution to the entanglement issue is to shrink, or to make it more palatable to people, is to shrink that scale of management. Before I talk about the dynamic stuff, let me step back and tell you why we think that that could actually work. So we've been doing uh, surveys within the sanctuary. We did them for, for about six or seven years, twice a year, to document co-location between humpback whales, great shear waters, and sandlands. So we've known for a long time sandlands are important for humpbacks, but we wanted to look at, can we actually quantify that and see, you know, what is that overlap and where is it? And we included great shear waters because, as Dave said, we have a program dedicated to tagging those animals, and they're the most common seabird in the sanctuary. And we've also known for centuries that one of the ways to find whales is to look for birds, right? So after doing these surveys, we quantified their co-location. If you look at the map, on the left, you can see all three colors, which is sandland humpbacks and great shear waters, co-located right in the southwest corner of Snow Island. So they are very tightly um, overlapping there. So great shear waters and humpbacks are coming together over these sandland hotspots. And if you remember from Dave's uh, entanglement risk map, that's the same spot where there's lots of gear interaction. So prey, predators, and gear coming together there. So we thought. Well, if we can uh, document this overlap between shear waters and humpbacks, can we then use our satellite tag shear waters to look at a wider area, like across the Gulf of Maine, to maybe help us locate humpbacks in near real time, because we're getting those satellite pings every day. Then we can say, this is where the whales are. Let's do some dynamic management action, like right now. Once those birds leave, we assume the whales leave, and then we can turn that management action off. So the first step to get to that would be, can we actually use birds to find whales? So we used our satellite tag uh, data from our great shear waters for every year uh, from 2013 to 2018, now looking at the figure on the right. And then we got humpback whale sightings from surveys, from aerial surveys and from the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, their research surveys across the entire Gulf of Maine. So we plotted out uh, shear water core habitat use areas, which are in blue on each map. And then humpback sightings are in black. And then we looked at how, uh, what's the percentage of humpback whale sightings falling within each bird area? Because we want to know, can we use birds to locate whales? So you can see the percentage in the top left-hand corner of each map. So in every year, almost every year, it's over 75% of humpback sightings are falling within those bird areas. 2018 was kind of an anomalous year. We think that's because there were um, low sailing abundance in that year. 
So of course, this depends on them overlapping uh, over salience hotspots. But another option here in terms of managing, managing entanglement would be to use this um, dynamic option. And you tried to do it with the right whales also. Good point. We tried to do it with the right whales also. The overlap was nowhere near as high, actually very low. So it looks like shear wires could be useful for documenting or finding humpbacks, but not so much for right whales. So one thing there would be, can we find other bird species that might overlap better with right whales that are eating similar prey to them? Mm -hmm. Like Wilson storm pebbles, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I forgot to mention that that we know that, that sand lance are feeding on, or that shear wires are feeding on sand lance um, because when we capture them, they defecate into the, we put them in these nice little bird carriers um, with aluminum foil and they defecate into that. And then we do DNA analysis to uh, to see what they're um, eating and the, the sand lances, they're made in prey. Oh, uh, this just came out yesterday. Yesterday, it's a population viability analysis um, that um, NOAA uh, hired uh, some people to, to do, and it was really, really fascinating. Uh, but entanglement is the thing that's driving right whales to extinction. So you, you can get that um, on that URL down at the bottom. It's a really, really great piece of, of information. Fascinating. As, as Richard Pace, who uh, was one of the co-authors on that, said, you know, all, all models are wrong, but some of them are informative. And this is a really informative one. Okay. That's it. Perfect. Thank you very much. And again, once again, lots of lots to unpackage there from uh, looking at uh, the, the interactions with the with the fisheries to also you know, looking at research and data and those sort of coexistence as well in, in predictive senses. So really interesting. And I, again. Not really for me to ask the questions here, but it's more for us to have an engagement and discussion here. So again, uh, whilst we we'll wait and see if we have any questions online, is there anything in the room for uh, for David and also of course from uh, Tammy's research as well? Quick question: We have this discussion like on Monday. For you, what is the difference between entanglement? And bycatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, and bycatch, a lot of bycatch is through entanglement, right? Okay. So, yeah, almost the same thing. <laughs> but, you know, we usually think of bycatch as coming onto the boat, mm -hmm. and large whales aren't coming onto the boat. Okay. So, like bycatch and birds and dolphins and things like that, they, they come over the side of the boat. Uh, we're entanglement. So, you, you better hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so the the small buoys that we saw during the whale watching trip yesterday are the ones that are used to mark the position of the pods, yes. things yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So the solution that we are visualizing is to replace that buoys with some acoustic releasing. Right. Rod. So so all that line would be rolled up at the bottom where the gear is, um, and then an acoustic release would would uh, set them free, and then that buoy would come to the surface, and then it would just act like a regular buoy. Um, several problems with it. Um, in addition, just to the um, engineering involved and the time it takes a fisherman, extra time it takes a fisherman to use that gear instead of the ones that they're already using. Um, one is setting over, you know, there's a, you can see how dense the, those areas are for gear, and if the lobstermen can see each other's buoys, they can make sure they're not going to set, well, at least minimize the likelihood of them setting over each other, um, which becomes really, really difficult if they do. Um, and two, uh, this is also a really heavily fished area for trawl, bottom trawlers. Uh, so if a trawler looks out and sees all these buoys, they go, oh, that's not a place that I should go fish because I'm going to mess up their gear, I'm going to mess up my gear. If there's no surface expression of all the gear that's on the bottom, um, then you've got an inter gear conflict waiting to happen. Okay. So those things need to be solved simultaneously um, to to these other issues. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's, it's not simple. Okay, no, no, it is because I was about to say that in Mexico, working with Paquita, we have this problem to uh, the depth of the moorings to deploy acoustic equipment. So we came with this 
simply ideal to deploy the equipment with two anchors connected with a long rope, mm -hmm. no buoy in the surface. So the fishermen were trying to grasp the line with a hook, throw it behind the boat. Yep. And they used to, after one year, they were able to uh, retrieve the equipment in 15 minutes. Yep. Yeah, so, grappling is something that's often been proposed. You know that that um, isn't quite as nowhere near as expensive, right? As, as having this stuff. So so grappling is is another possibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's so much gear out there that your chance of grappling somebody else's gear is really high. Cool. Yeah. Have you had that issue with fishermen kind of setting across each other or pulling the rock? No, we, we were deploying only forty six marines. Oh, okay. Separated by four kilometers, so there is not a conflict with that. Yeah. But it was really useful because the tip was reducing. Oh, he's totally a lot. seeing that in that situation be a, a really the, the perfect low cost um, way to do it, right? Yeah, exactly. How deep was that? How deep the water? Yeah. Oh, the area is only 30 meters in average. But the tidal range is six meters, eight meters. So. Mm -hmm. But you know, oceanographic scientists you use these acoustically. <laughs> Never mind. I got it. Thanks. I was going to say, just, just out of uh, curiosity, I say, you know, like you said, the, the, we, we need to go towards that more automated, ropeless in the, in the column sort of way. But, What's the what's the financial ask of fishermen to, to ship to that? What's the difference between sort of the standard in-water column uh, rope gear in comparison to sort of this this oh, new one? Hundred thousand oh. dollars, really expensive. And that's but, that's without then, as you say, with the trawler coming through and wiping out somebody's you know, right? Like you know, again, um, all these things are solvable with effort. Mm -hmm. You know, if if nobody wants to do it, well, then it'll never happen. Mm -hmm. So it's like you know, our, our tag with drones, right? Um, people have been talking about it, doing it for a long time, but it's just never done because nobody put the effort into that that the Ocean Alliance people put into mm -hmm. to figure out how to do it. You know, I, I, as I say, it takes more than a desire and a drone to tag mm -hmm. these whales with a drone. Yeah. Same thing. Um, you know, but where there's a will, there's a way. You know, right now, the, the will is. Mm -hmm. Outside of the scientific, yeah. <laughs> so then that is my next. Did you is there is there is there much of take at all? Have you got any fishermen that are really sort of oh, engaging with it? Or absolutely. is it, yeah, I mean, the fishermen are, are, are some of my favorite people because they're just so resourceful. Mm -hmm. You know, when 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 Armageddon or whatever comes, I want to be in a fishing tank because they're going to survive. <laughs> but Armageddon is here for right whales, but we just haven't, you know, convinced everybody that that it's what they should be putting their time and effort into. But there's there's several fishermen that are really really being super super helpful. Um, there, there's a person on, on Cape Cod, Rob Martin, who has his um, he's got his own lobster boat and he's got a a, a fish company. And he only sells lobster that he's caught with buoyless gear. So, you know, that's the kind of thing we want to start, you know, showing. If we can say, hey, people will pay twice as much for lobster if you fish like this, well, then that's a really good incentive. Um, you know, those, those are the things that we have to move towards. Is it the case? Because the cost of the lobster is higher? Or... Say that again? Is it the case? Is lobster cost more when it's uh, fishing as well? Or not? Well, he's the only one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but, but potentially, I, I think that you know, with the right marketing, um, it's like dolphin safe tuna. Yeah, you yeah. know, pe people want to um, spend money on things that yeah. are helpful. So, so. I hope. <laughs> One might find out. <laughs> right. Any further, any further questions, comments, experiences, reflections? I had a question. Um, the work you're doing on birds and whales is really fascinating. I was wondering how long does the tag, how long do the tags stay on the birds, the satellite tags? Yeah. 
I think to come out on average, like 90 to 120 days, because we've had some deployments that are like 200 plus days. We cracked some glacier water down to their breeding grounds in the Tristan de Kuna Islands in the middle of the South Atlantic. Um, but just a handful of data out there. And what is the limiting factor? Do they fall off or is the battery or? Good question. So when, when we lose a transmission from a tag, we don't know if we lost the tag or we lost the bird. Um, some of the analysis we've been doing uh, recently our RV Georgia Associate Kevin Powers just looked at the temperature of readings on the tag. It's just a metric they send back. And it seems like when the temperature of the tag drops below a certain level, we lose transmission, which suggests it's the tag failing and not the bird, which is a good thing, but we don't really know. And we, we use there's a metric that your tag shouldn't be more than 3% of the body weight of the bird. And, and we adhere to that religiously. Um, matter of fact, we, we don't even like 3%. We'd rather have it. You know, much more conservative. Mm -hmm. but, and, and we've even had some, we had one bird that actually started breeding with the tag on. Um, we, just, we were tracking it and went to the, um, went to the Tristan Island and then stopped, stopped transmitting. So oh, well, you know, that's too bad, you know, we kind of need, and all of a sudden, two weeks later, started transmitting again and went from Tristan to, to Patagonia and then back and then stopped transmitting again. And the only thing we could figure out was that they nest in burrows. So we're figuring it must have been going under, you know, into the borough where it would transfer and then come back out and start transmitting again when it was, you know, forage. Anything else? I don't see that we have any questions online. Um, so if we slow we go in. The recording is going to stop when you call <laughs> so, if there's no more questions in the room, and more comments, and that brings us nicely onto our final topic or final theme for discussion, uh, which is well watching. So, very pleased to give the floor to Tammy and Dave to give us some. Oversights on actions to, to limit or uh, manage well what should we say? Over to you. Thank you. I'll start since Dave is busy making us feel better. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi everybody, my name is Tammy Silva. I'm a research scientist here at the Sanctuary. Maybe Slocum's over there. He's our vessel operator hi, coordinator. Um, hi everyone online. And we just thought we'd start um with a quick introduction to our experience, just so you understand the different perspectives that we bring to today's topic of whale watching in the sanctuary. So I've been here at the sanctuary for about five years. Prior to that, I spent eight years as a naturalist working on board commercial whale watching vessels. So I worked for a couple of different companies on a few different boats, all out of Massachusetts, which frequented the sanctuary almost every trip. Um, and right now I'm the sanctuary's point of contact for two whale watching edu education programs that you'll hear about. Well, sense and see it's about. Dave, do you want to go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, you can see we used some retro pictures to come in. Tammy <laughs> <laughs> said, You've been doing this so long, we need to get a real idea of what it was like back then. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm vessel, uh, vessel and facilities operations here. Uh, I've worked for 20 plus years uh, in and with the whale watching industry, and we, I guess I'll just say we see them as um, as partners in this whole process and uh, have interacted with them over the years. All right, so I know some of you got the chance to go out to the sanctuary yesterday. If, if you haven't been, please come back and go. It's definitely one of the best places to whale watch in the world. But we wanted to start with just a little virtual tour of what it's like in the sanctuary in the summertime. 
So um, really important feeding ground for humpback whales. You'll see humpback whale surface feeding. Just some of the amazing pictures people have taken in the sanctuary over the years, acrobatic behavior, like breaching, you'll see socializing, you'll see resting. But summer in the sanctuary can also look like this. So lots of boats, as you've heard, lots of different kinds of boats, whale watching boats, fishing boats, recreational boats. In certain parts of the sanctuary at certain times, you'll have 50 or 60 vessels in like a one kilometer by one kilometer. Yeah. Sometimes getting too close to whales, like the compact whale just trying to take a little nap here on the left hand side. So there can be crowding, there can be disturbance. Um, so you can imagine the challenges and this trade off. Whale watching has lots of benefits, but then you have to figure out ways to manage this disturbance too. History. <laughs> so, whale watching here in Stalag and Bank began in, in the 70s officially. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, it, it was fishermen. Fishermen who were out at sea noticed the whales and interacted with them or observed them and thought, you know, this might be something we can do. So, uh, actual individual in Provincetown. Um, started taking people out on his fishing boat whale watching. And then others did the same, people from Gloucester, people from Boston. And in the 1980s, it really became quite a, a substantial business with really very minimal um, oversight, although some basic, uh, some, some, some fairly basic guidelines evolved. Primarily that of the um, the close approach rule, right? Still, uh, all, always guidelines, though. And then in the in the nineteen nineties, uh, and I think it's worth stating that as a result of some faster vessels, technology had evolved. Uh, some faster vessels were being built. Some uh, fair amount of money was being invested in the industry, and uh, there were some collisions. So people started talking about regulations. People started talking about more oversight. And what occurred was the whale watching industry at the time said, well, let's make sure we're involved with this. We think we can do better than this. We think we can create or improve upon the guidelines. So that's what happened uh, in, in, the, in the 1990s. And those are actually the guidelines we, we currently still have today. So one of the things that started with whale watching is that commercial whale watching really supported some of the first whale research on the East Coast. And a lot of the early whale researchers worked as naturalists, which added value to passenger experiences because they're getting to hear from someone who actually study whales, which created this really nice partnership between research and education and conservation all through the whale watching industry. So the data that's been collected from whale watching vessels have really helped us understand some of the basics about especially humpback whale biology, but other species as well. So here, uh, in the Gulf of Maine, we have one of the best detailed humpback whale catalogs in the world, well over a thousand individuals individually identified. And we can track their entire family line and help us learn about all of these different aspects of their life history from movement and migrations to habitat use to calving and reproduction as well as site fidelity. And it was actually sightings from whale watching vessels that helped us identify Stella Wagon Bank as an important feeding area that led to its designation as a sanctuary in 1992. So whale watching today, we have about eight commercial companies that visit the sanctuary. Those vessels can carry anywhere from six to 400 plus passengers, like both some of you were on yesterday from the New England Aquarium. Most of the vessels are larger, 80 to 120 feet long. Um, there's also substantial recreational whale watching that happens. Lots of rec boats out there, people just going out to see the whales. Almost all of the companies have some kind of research program or data collection program, often an internship program, and also an education program where they're educa educating passengers about what they're seeing. And I think Ben and Pete mentioned earlier uh, a study in 2018 and 2019 
documented uh, whale watching generates about 182 million per year in economic activity. So before we get into the details of the guidelines, I just wanted to take a second to talk about U.S. marine mammal laws so you really understand what the guidelines do. So in the U.S., marine mammals are protected by two laws, the Marine Mammal Protection Act or the MMPA, and then the Endangered Species Act or the ESA. And both of these make it illegal to harass marine mammals. But what is harassment? So harassment is defined as any act that can potentially injure or disturb a marine mammal by interrupting its behavior. So you're out on a boat, you interrupt feeding, nursing, resting, you change that behavior in any way, that's harassment. And violations of either one of those laws can result in civil or criminal penalties, fines of up to $50,000, forfeiture of your vessel, or in some cases, prison time. Now on to the guidelines. So the guidelines are intended to assist with avoiding harassment. One of the things we try to do, and any commercial captain should be trying to do, any boater for that matter who's interacting with whales, is to not change the whale's behavior in any way. So it was the intent of the guidelines to assist with awareness, attention to detail, uh, to meet this goal. So being guidelines, they are something that you would consider to be voluntary, right? It's not a regulation. As a guideline, really um, unenforceable. Uh, how do we, we we've had these uh, conversations with, uh, with our law enforcement folks, and the recurring theme here from the perspective of law enforcement and enforceability is they need something to work with. And so unfortunately our guidelines don't provide that for them. But the intent of the guidelines and once you see these guidelines you'll I think you'll say that that seems complicated to me, right? It they're, they're fairly involved. And that complexity is an additional issue, right? But the intent is to create enough awareness, enough attention to detail that uh, the, the, the safety factor is accomplished. I think I might need my visual aids. <laughs> okay. Mike, could you help me with my visual aids, please? <laughs> so here we have a whale and here we have a vessel and here we have our guidelines so what are we trying not to do we're trying not to disturb the whale certainly what we do not want to do is head off the path of the whale right the goal is if we want to watch a whale from this vessel we parallel a whale. We we when we approach, first of all, we approach slowly, and you can see our concentric rings. So we have one whale in the middle. Of course, this is a very dynamic situation, right? We can have one whale, maybe, or we can have five whales, and they may not just be logging like this whale is doing. They may be feeding, they may be very active. So this is a very dynamic situation. So as we approach, the goal is we see a whale off in the distance. We make a judgment as to distance, two nautical miles. If we see a vessel, a whale watch vessel in that off in the distance, we may maybe make an assumption that vessel might be beside some whales. So we slow being cautious and we slow meeting these criteria to the best of our ability. But judgment, equipment, 
different vessels. So my equipment on my vessel might be different than your, very likely will be different than your equipment on your vessel. Your ability to perceive and, and estimate two nautical miles may be very different from mine. This is often a very, uh, very learned sort of um, skill tested and, and, and uh, rechecked over time. So we slow, we slow, we get closer. We try not to get too many boats around whales, right? So again, close approach. We never intend to approach closer than 100 feet. But 100 feet, my vessel is 100 feet. <laughs> so I often say to people, 100 feet, does that sound far? That's only one boat length. It's very close. Mm -hmm. It's very close. It's a very, this is a large whale. <laughs> um, this is a 150. <laughs> so um, we, we address a lot of different issues with these guidelines. The concentric rings, the, the try to be only 15 minutes as the closest vessel in here, and then possibly the standby vessels out here, right? Approximately, you know, no more than two vessels and everyone else standing off here and everyone communicating, talking to each other professionally and friendly, <laughs> right? It, it, it's, it's okay. a lot of it's not real world, right? That doesn't really always happen, but it, but it, it, it does happen to an extent, and it does achieve an awareness. Um, and people really, you know, companies really do this. It's not 15 minutes <coughs> that they're in there. They get their time, and maybe there's two vessels in that space, and they, and but someone will go off the one the vessel that's been there. I'll go look. I'll go look for something else. They go off looking. For other people, other. So this is all in the commercial whale watch world, right? But then bring all the private vessels into the mix here. And it gets very confusing. It gets very busy. We we are we've been out with our outreach. There are so whales in the middle, just 30, 40, 50 boats all around, all around. Nowhere for the whales to go, but down. You know, they can go. And to a large extent, these whales are, many of them have grown up with this, right? Or lived, grown, um, I think it was Mason called our whales, uh, Mason Weinrich, the, the urban whale. If I'm not mistaken, was that Mason? I mean, it's kind, kind of common. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, I think he, I think he wrote a, a, a paper or something, but, but in any case, it, um, they they do they do have an a, an awareness of the vessels right but everyone's not really super careful everyone's not always paying attention the private vessels are certainly don't have the awareness the professional uh, captains have um also one of the things worth noting here is and and the incidents that occurred that prompted the discussion for these guidelines were collisions that occurred with whales when vessels were returning to port. If you, it, I think this became part of the discussion at the time. I think it's worth noting when, when operators go out to sea and they're looking for whales, when captains are going to look for whales, they're very aware. They 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 desperately want to find whales. They want to have success. When they re, when they're finished with their trip with their whale watch, they return to port. There's a there's a relaxation thing that occurs. There's a not so diligent an eye on the horizon. Or on what's around them. So the a significant part of these guidelines was that you would leave the area 
with the same care that you entered the area. And is that is that always met to the letter of the guidelines? Certainly not. Uh, does that is is that intent built in within within these guidelines and the awareness in the minds of the the captains that run the commercial well watch boats? Yes, it is. Uh, but then again, there's this whole additional issue of the private vessels. What is their what is their knowledge? What is their background? What do they understand about whale behavior? So we have these voluntary guidelines. What are the things that we are doing to make sure that the public is aware of these guidelines and able to follow them? And also that folks that are going on commercial whale watching vessels are aware of the guidelines and can make smart choices about their ecotourism. So one of the programs is called See a Spout, Watch Out. This is a program geared towards recreational whale watchers where there are these seven different tips. Many of them come directly from the guidelines with a few additions. So see a spout, watch out, there's a whale there, slow down. Um, head on is wrong, lots of boats, talk to folks. You should be communicating with people and um, taking turns watching whales. Avoid trouble, steer clear of bubbles. This is pertinent to us because we have lots of feeding whales. If you're seeing bubble nets or bubble clouds, there's a whale that's going to the surface there. Be careful. Don't chase, give whale space. Drop your sails when watching whales or sailboats. And then be shaped low, right whale below. Just be particularly careful if you see right whales because they have actually regulations involved with their approach. And the other program we're a part of is Whale Sense. So Whale Sense is a voluntary education and recognition program. This is for commercial whale watching companies. So this is a program that recognizes companies that really go above and beyond in following the guidelines and promoting ocean stewardship. So this gives a way for the public to go on the Whale Sense website and look at which companies are going above and beyond, who's following the guidelines, who's making sure that whales are safe, and they're able to make a choice about where they spend their money. Uh, you can see the acronym SENSE there in the middle. So companies that are part of the program, they stick to whale watching guidelines, they educate passengers, they notify of whales in trouble, set an example for other boaters and encourage ocean stewardship. And some of the things that companies have to do as part of the program are complete annual training. So captains and naturalists and sometimes even crew complete the annual whale sense training. They have to do an ocean stewardship project. So this could be an internship program. Some companies do recycling, those kinds of things. Uh, ensure advertising, that they're making sure folks are aware of the whale sense program, they adhere to the criteria and they promote whale sense. You can see our different partners there on the right hand side. NOAA Fisheries, Whale and Dolphin Conservation, Audubon Society of Rhode Island, and the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And it's those same partners that work on the whale sense program. I'm sorry, the CS Found program. So our voter outreach, um, this is this is what we created to get out on the water to be visible to interact with boaters that are engaged in operating around whales. The intent was not to directly interact with commercial whale watch companies, but to bring outreach material, to be a visible presence, and to relieve some pressure on the whales on these busy summer days. So we've had some, some quite good success with this. Uh, we take our uh, primary vessel AUK and then this 16 foot rib, we get out and we basically, we get to whales and uh, engage people. Some are very, very interested and just happy to see us. And we repeatedly see you know, the same people or the same vessels year after year. And others, not so much, don't really want anything to do with us. And they all, a, a, lot, of, a lot of people want to tell us how much they know and that they, they know everything there is to know about whales, which you know, <laughs> is interesting. And um, so 
we we say our piece about about who we are and what we're doing and we move on but it's been very very uh, um uh rewarding this program and uh we really one of our limiting some the usual things are limiting us right um people and funding so uh we could you know we could use more people to do this and we could use more funds to make it happen so but very fun very successful uh, and one of the interesting components i'll add is that we often get the whale watch companies on busy days in the summer calling us saying telling us of the conditions that's it's challenging it's difficult please they say to us please get out here please um come in and and do your outreach if, if you can so uh they they see a benefit as well i think this year was a busy summer. We only got out for one bow trip, and it was actually a not great weather. It was a slow Sunday, right. but we managed to talk with eight vessels and a total of 42 people. Right. And, and so what we look for on these days, and, and we don't always have the opportunity when we're available, but we look for great weather, right? We The criteria is weather and timing that will place the maximum number of, of pleasure craft out on a given day. Because that, that's our goal, get out there on the busiest of days. And we have hit that on the money in the past. It's been sometimes horrifically busy. I recall one day there were so many boats that we, it was hard to know which way to turn. We would we would stop to discuss, uh, inter interact with one vessel, and that would mean we'd turn our backs to the whales, and then just a whole swarm of pleasure craft would move in around those whales. So it it was challenging, but we got to an awful lot of people. And, yeah, those days are nice because you can talk to a lot of people. Yes. You, know, you have just a sleeping calf, and there's like. You know, there's supposed to be one vessel in the standby zone. There's 10 vessels around this sleeping gap in the standby zone. And it's like, right. So this was our outreach at New England Boat Show, which what we did here was um, we, we set these the timings for this uh, PowerPoint where people could come to this location at the boat show and watch us make this, this presentation, a PowerPoint on interacting with whales, operating a, a, a small boat around whales, and then interact with us, much like Tammy and I are here, here today, ask Tammy the naturalist questions, ask the uh, a captain questions, um, how to operate, what to look for. We would te teach the people about whale behavior, what to expect to see and, and things to be concerned with, uh, uh, things to be careful about. And it was very successful. If I had the ability to do this again, what I learned is that the sort of um, the seminar scenario, which cost would have cost us money that we didn't have. The seminar scenario might have been a a, a better uh, environment for this. This was sort of just people showed up very casually uh, to watch a presentation. They didn't necessarily sign up for it. Maybe that was fine, but I just think uh, the seminars work well in that environment. But in any case, it was very successful and and fun. And if you don't know, the boat show is like where people go to buy boats. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, a chance to meet lots of recreational boaters. Yes. Live guidelines, not regulations. So I might have touched on this a little bit earlier, but back in the 90s, there, there was not an appetite for regulation. And we often hear this depending on the environment, politically or otherwise, 
uh, we with regulations there 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 needs with the promulgation of regulations there need to there needs to be sufficient support for that. Um, the whale watching industry at the time was not supportive of it, and they believed that they could that it was in everyone's best interest to self police. And this is, and then additionally, so it was a double edged sword with these regulations that evolved because they're so complex, they're they're not transferable to regulation, right? They're too complicated. What we continually learn from law enforcement is, is simplicity is the key when it comes to regulation because they just can't handle all the, all the details of, the, all the minute details. What they wanna see is, did, did a vessel get too close, right? Did, did a vessel violate this clearly uh, demonstrable rule or regulation? And our existing guidelines are, are way too complex for that. And we, we, we knew that when these were created, but they were not created as regulations. And so they were all trying to be all encompassing. So one of the questions then, because we have these voluntary guidelines, is do people actually follow them? Are operators of whale watching vessels complying with these guidelines? And is it having the intended outcome? So uh, Dave Wiley led a research study to look at this. There were kind of secret shopper researchers placed on whale watching vessels. Mm -hmm. So whale watching companies didn't know they were there and they were making um, uh, documenting the distance and the speed that whale watching boats were traveling to whales. So they can, those concentric circles, they're making measurements. Are they following the speed limits with each one of those distance circles? And so here the figure on the right is showing the non-compliance level. So a compliance level of zero is total compliance. A level of one is total non-compliance. And the way that was calculated is so if a, a company has 70% non-compliance, that means the distance traveled, they were non-compliant in terms of speed over 70% of that distance traveled. So you, on the bottom axis there is each whale watching company. That was part of the study in the first panel. And so all companies had greater than 70% non-compliance in this case. Um, non-compliance was significantly higher in the outer zones of those rings, which is the panel on the right. So you can see once you get to zone one, which is the zone that's closest to the whale, compliance was at its lowest at almost 60% non-compliance, sorry. And then just a note here of consideration that, of course, there are some operators that follow the guidelines, right? You can see that here. This is company averages, so it doesn't take into account those boats that are doing the right thing necessarily. Yes. So again, the challenge is here, the complexity of the guidelines, the consent, the concentric rings, the approaches, the equipment or judgment required. I mean, I, I would suggest that, that it's so complex, you know, uh, Tammy and I could be going out at the same time and our judgment based on our equipment on different vessels, our ability to, to visually, let's say, see a whale two miles away, um, our, our equipment would all dictate how we perceived the situation and slow down. And again, I point to the guidelines and say, if you're looking for compliance, go to regulation. If you're looking for a desired outcome, guidelines might achieve it. But guidelines are not something you're, you're, you're doing if you're looking for compliance. They're voluntary. They're a guideline. So I, I'm not at all surprised, you know, with the outcome of this.
So if we're mostly having non-compliance, even though there might be good outcomes most of the time, should we reconsider regulation based on what we're seeing on the water? So there's a lot going on. We have feeding and rusting whales. There's commercial and recreational whale watching. There's commercial and recreational fishing, recreational boating. We heard about noise earlier. All of that's creating substantial noise around these whales that are just trying to go about their natural behavior. We've noted and others have noted frequent and routine violations of the Marine Animal Protection Act in so and that means animals are actually being harassed their behavior is being changed by these vessels and so that raises the question do we need regulations so we have hawaii and alaska in the united states that actually have approached regulations which prohibit uh, vessels from getting within 100 yards or in case of aircraft a thousand feet if you're in hawaii so precedent for these regulations does exist in the u.s and so do we need those in spnms and as dave said in order to have regulations, they have to be simple and enforceable for them to work. And so lastly, just to go back to our management plan and just reiterate what we're doing again to make sure we're lessening whale watching's impact. So we're, uh, we go down to the activities on the bottom, you know, expanding the bow program, making sure we can get out on those busy days during the summer and reach as many recreational boaters as we can. Um, exploring partnerships of bow. So can we provide incentives for recreational boaters to take sea and spout courses? Can we say, hey, you get a discount on your boating insurance? Can we work with harbor masters or other community members to make sure we're getting the word out about how you're supposed to operate safely around whales? And then continue our partnerships with NOAA Fisheries and other groups to maintain our whale sense and sea and spout education programs. I just want to add one more thing. Thanks so much. So again, an additional complexity is the difference between the commercial whale watch company, right? And then the pleasure craft and then the fishing of vessels. It, you know, it, it's it's very challenging to create any one thing that will will manage all of that unless it's regulation. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we find different at different times, different groups doing well, different groups putting a lot of uh, undue pressure on whales. Um, so yes, there's a great deal of the challenge there for the different the different groups involved. Super, thank you so much. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? Yes, sir. Hey, do you find it different if there's a lot of whales out there versus just a handful of whales out there? So it varies. That's a good question because sometimes you'll have just so seasonally, as you saw the other um, the research that was presented. You know that some some years, like there's a lot of sand lines, there's a lot of birds, there's a lot of whales. Other years, not so much. So, for the most part, the more whales there are, the more the pressure is spread out, right? Because, uh, you know, generally speaking, but and and there have been years. I mean, back when I remember two whales on the northwest corner of the bank, every whale watch boat in the area was going there, mm -hmm. every trip. That's all there was on the bank. And then, you know, some years, you, you just have many more whales. The word gets out more that there are more whales, that it's more interesting, that there's a lot to see, so more pleasure craft get out. But it it sometimes it's dispersed, sometimes it isn't. Another thing that happens is pleasure craft will follow whale watch vessels. So they don't necessarily know where to look, but they know where to look for a whale watch vessel. And that puts all the pressure on the whales that that whale watch vessel goes to, that commercial vessel. I mean, I've had, I mean, boats follow you out of the harbor. 
spend the day with you and then follow you home. If you've ever watched a group of like five year olds play soccer or football, but they all just it's like, like that. follow the ball around, that's kind of what it is. If there's only a few whales, a whale walk will move, then everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's maddening as a, as a, operator as a captain it's maddening and sometimes you go you literally would go and say i'm going S talk to the rest of the commercial team and you'll say i'm going i'm not going anywhere i'm just gonna just trying to take some people with me <laughs> literally go just go make a loop <laughs> and see who follows and that's go to the edge of the world yeah <laughs> sometimes you let's say let me see i'm gonna see how far are they gonna follow but I mean, these are the, you know, these are the things that uh, some that that captains are, are trying to do to relieve pressure. Other things, you know, are not so good. They're doing not so good things, right? They're they're actually um, commercial captains will cut off small boats. They'll physically put their vessel block, block them from whales. Um, and in some cases, is shouting back and forth. It's that's you know we don't that's not a good place to get to. That's not where we want to be. Yes. So we have the um, we have a question online uh, from um, somebody called Noah. So it's saying going into the future, in your opinion, are any beneficial regulatory changes likely to happen? Well, I, I mean, personally, and Tam, feel free to jump in here when you, you know, if you like, but I'm very hopeful that they will. I'm thinking there's, personally, I'm thinking there's more of an appetite now for regulation than there was in the 90s. And the reason I say that is I see the, the frustration on the level of the commercial operators out there. They call me, they they call me and say, can you please get out here? Can you help? It it's it got very bad during COVID because if you don't, if this didn't happen everywhere around the world, it happened here. People didn't go to work as much and they went out and bought boats. <laughs> and you, you couldn't buy a boat to, if you if you needed one back then. They were all bought and they were all out, you know, all summer long looking at whales. And that's that's overflowed to now. It has. Uh, they're all using those boats to get out. They, that's right. They, they haven't all sold them. They haven't all traded them in. They're getting out there. And, and this part of it is a double-edged sword, right? The education of the public on this stuff because the more, and this was a concern when we did all those, um, the, the boat show lectures, right? Pe some people would say, well, are you sure you wanna tell all these people where to find whales and how to do it? <laughs> and went, well, no, we're not sure, but you know, I mean, Ben's done this with shipwrecks, right? Um, it, it, and you know, at, at some point you've got to do something to try to make it better and the status quo is not making it better. So we hope education is the key. Uh, yes. Um, if, um, how, if you do regulate them, how um, do you do the folks that do enforcement, do, th do they think it will be enforceable? So that is the idea, right? Mm -hmm. That the regulation, the, the promulgation of regulation works hand in hand with Office of Law Enforcement and comes up with a plan. We we know from providing information to law enforcement over the years, we know they tell, uh, can't do anything with that, can't do anything with that, can't do anything with that. Uh, do you have video? Mm, yes. Okay, let's look at it. Can we, you know, they need something demonstrable, right? And the thing about a regulation the thing about an approach regulation, if you said a regulation was that no vessel could ever, and like with North Atlantic right whales, those are enforceable. Mm -hmm. All you need, it, and with technology now and drone overflight, uh, law enforcement has some great tools. You can measure and you can say, 
yes, you were that close, violation, here's the outcome. I just know that sometimes with when you're doing, watching somebody that you think is harassing, um, that it just depends on what angle you're at viewing it too, so. You're absolutely right. This is very much a problem with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I've been on many boats, I, I can tell you, two boats side by side. People on this boat say, we're doing everything right, they're doing everything mm -hmm. wrong. People on this boat say, we're doing everything right, they're doing everything wrong. <laughs> very common. So perspective is, is everything. That's why technology is greatly assisting with this with drone, overflight, photo, video, you can measure. Mm -hmm. This is the, you know, and even in the past with uh, Alaska and Hawaii, you can see regulations are very simple. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happened this summer that's making us consider whether we need to revisit regulations is we had received some reports of tuna fishermen trolling through feeding whales. So they're dragging their gear through bubble nets um, with the idea that if whales are feeding there, then tuna might also be feeding there on sand lands. And so that's a whole another thing to deal with, you know, aside from the recreational education that we need to do. And that's one of the things actually that is somewhat, that is enforceable and our law enforcement is looking at that, mm -hmm. right? They have actual, they're, they're trying to, if gear, it's it's not unlike an entanglement, but it, this is intentional, casting mm -hmm. into whales, right? And I think some of the photos show hooks on, you know, fishing gear and hooks stuck in whales. Mm -hmm. So our, our law enforcement folks are working on identifying, proving who that gear belongs to and and, and enforcing though that as a harassment. Yeah, that's, that was my question. Looking at your presentation, that you started your presentation with, I can't remember, the, you have Tulo more or less, or Tulo, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and I can't remember the second one. And if this was well enforced, like, would it be enough or no? Because you can define harassment by more or less everything which is not, right in line with like quail watching regulation. So do you have like statistics on how oh, is it enforced, how much fine have people done jail with this or it's it's still like poorly enforced and needs there's not enough eyes on the water. Okay. So yeah, so yeah. it'll be the same with whale watching. Yeah. yeah. We don't we don't see it. Um there's not enough eyes. And if we and law enforcement will say it you know even from some photos, certainly they in here they can't prove anything yeah, from somebody saying something. So yeah. even if you have mandatory guidelines, the problem will remain the same, no? With with guidelines, it remains the same. Mandatory, even mandatory guideline, if, if you can't enforce it, it's not. It would have to the, come with funding for. More okay, so yeah, but, but yeah. maybe like just ensuring or strengthening the Marine Mammal Protection Act would be a first. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But just it's developing just, new guidelines and it's just a lot harder to prove prove harassment than it is to prove that you are within a hundred feet of that whale. Yeah, but maybe you can among the law to better define what harassment is. They've tried. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 there have been a lot of discussions about, about what sure is behavioral disturbance, mm. right? Um, but the folks that document harassment the most are the whale watching companies. Like they are the eyes that are on the water every single day. And when there is a you know a violation by a wreck boat, they're the ones that are documenting it if they can and reporting it to law enforcement. It, it and and it's them, it's the company or it's a passenger or, or it's multiple people. It's the it's a naturalist. I mean that that's why you know they they really are partners. They don't always do everything perfectly, but they're partners and a uh, question. Yeah, a cu couple of things. It's just on oh. that note, do the whale watching vessels report on each other? They do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just recently, <laughs> very recently. Yes. Yeah. And so, a recent example: uh, a whale not whale watch naturalist called me to report on a captain of another whale watch company, and so I get some basic information, and then I pass it on to. Office of Law Enforcement, and 
you know, I just say, this is the contact, this is what I was told. And then that the law enforcement officer will call that naturals, discuss it. Um, I followed up. Do you have photo? Do you have video? No. Um, and you can imagine all the other conversations. Oh, I don't really, you know, I don't really want to get this person in trouble. Yeah. I know, I know. But if you do nothing, it's not going to be. Mm -hmm. And then this person also said, on this boat, I said, have you seen this happen since? Well, no, we've been avoiding that vessel. So our passengers won't see what they're doing. These are not all good things. Yeah. So that that does happen. I don't want to leave people with the impression that that does not happen in the commercial whale watching world. It is more the, the anomaly than the rule. However, people are generally, and um, not to sort of criticize my generation too much, but it's it's my people, my generation, that the old school people might be lazy, might be disgruntled, might not care. I find that the newer people, the younger people are are being trained better, being taught better. You know, my generation just grew up with it and 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 did it. And a lot of them, like I said, came from the early days and were fishermen. Do you think that the presence of so the, re the research vessel, for example, actually has an impact on how compliant people are with those guidelines? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They, um, we're not unlike, uh, even though we, we're we not, we don't have a direct law enforcement component. Yeah. We're a research yeah. vessel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we have, we're, we're a research vessel and we're doing outreach. Yeah. However, uh, we're still like the policeman on the side of the road yeah. People flash their lights mm -hmm. and say, slow down because there's a policeman up there. Mm -hmm. um, and then more so if it's if it's Coast Guard out there or OLE, then they're calling each other, telling each other that the Coast Guard or law enforcement is there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it has an effect. That's actually the reason the whale watch companies like us to go out there. They don't care that we're, you know, educating people. What they care about is when we're there, pressure is relieved off of the whales they're looking at. Uh, I also have a question. Um, in your, uh, I was, um, I uh, I made a two uh, whale watching tour. <laughs> <laughs> the one. Uh, for the one we turn back to the uh, to Boston. Well, so um, I, I was surprised uh, because uh, on the boat they say you are you are guaranteed to see well. If guaranteed. You, if you yes, if we, you if we don't see well, you can come back another day. Yes. For me, wow, it's incredible. <laughs> um, we we don't have whale watching uh, in my uh, natural marine park. We have dolphin watching, and we have a charter where that we propose to our partner. And um, in the charter, uh, it is written that uh, you don't have to focus your communication about marine mammals. So. Uh, even we are trying that uh, there are not a marine mammals, uh, big marine mammals on the photo, on the flyers, on the, everything. They, they can be, but it could be the the focus point. So, so we are also trying to make them uh, speaking about birds, about the, the maritime heritage, um, lighthouse, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a very different uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you if you develop a new regulation, is it a point uh, that that you already already think about uh, this uh, ground guarantee? Yeah. 
it is a, it is a point the, the guarantee the guarantee is a a, a a funny thing that's a company that's a company related thing just the company has the choice to say this right the private whale watch company says yes if 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 we don't see whales this day we we give you another time to come back no additional charge right that's what that guarantee am i answering your question um, yes hoping i'm a, understanding uh, yes but um so uh well for, for me it's incredible this. okay so um because uh it means that uh it's not uh like uh well um how to say that um when you're going uh, yourself on the sea, it's never it could never be guaranteed. Yes, correct. When you, when you are yes. making a scientific uh, operation, it's never guaranteed. Yes, correct. correct. Uh, so I think it's a part of the education too uh, to say that it could it couldn't be guaranteed. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so so it's my point of view. Yes. But I, I just want your point of view about yeah, this. I think a lot when you're when you're some naturalists will say we have a very good chance of seeing whales. Of course, this is a natural environment. Mm -hmm. There are some days where we don't see whales, but I think it's because of our area and the, the likelihood of having whales here is mm -hmm. so great that they're able to make that guarantee. And, and I also think it's a commercial thing, you know, like yeah. come come with us, you see where yes. most of the people are here today, so they yes. can come back the next day. So basically, like when is there and it's right. done. So yes. Yes. But a lot yes. of naturalists will caveat it with like this is the what this is nature. Of course, yeah. we can't guarantee what's yes. gonna happen. But the problem is once one company does it. Oh, yeah, they want to do it. And, and to be honest, and you're right. Um, I think the language is such we we don't we 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 don't say guarantee here like um, you're thinking guarantee. They're using the word slightly differently. They're just using it to say um, we we prefer not to give you your money back. <laughs> if if we don't see anything yeah. today, we prefer to keep your money and then thank you and then <laughs> come back another time. And sometimes uh sometimes if you're heading home, you're out of the country, you're visiting, you can't come back. And it's up to you to say, excuse me, but please, I can't come back. And then I mean, when I did this, I said, by all means. Please have wow. your money back because okay. if you can't come back. But in our dolphin watching yes. uh, activities, for example, you have something like uh, well, more than a 90 percent uh, uh, sightings of yes. uh, bottomless dolphins. Yes. So uh, sometimes it arrives. It's very rare. Yes. It arrives. Yes. That uh, there are no the dolphin sightings right well, right so so what they say they only say well sorry it was not the day yes uh but you you went with us you can you could have seen um the the lighthouse yeah uh, yes I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's or, or your money back <laughs> uh, yeah. yes yes, yes. But because because the the communication is not focused on marine mammals, I understand. It's they, that's it's more of a to, that, yes. So that's more of a nature cruise. That's more of a natural cruise. That's more um, and and that's all fine. Um, yes, I just I'll just say it's just very much of a company. It's a it's a selling point. It's, mm. it's a selling point. It's trying to say. We have a very high chance of seeing these whales, and if we don't um, come back again, mm -hmm. yes. So I mentioned for your dolphin watching, there's a program in some parts of the U.S. like in Hawaii. It's similar to Whale Sense, but it's called Dolphin Smart. So another voluntary program that recognizes companies that do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Fine. So one last question, then we're, we're very close to time. So um, I asked a few online, but I'll end there's last one. So for those that are online, please do email 
and uh, then handing your questions. <laughs> Um, so from um, from Jerome, so it's a few questions I think. Um, yes. And it's from Diagua Sanctuary. From Agua Sanctuary in the Caribbean. Our sister sanctuary. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So were you able to evaluate the level of harassment due to the level of non-compliance? Yes. And if you consider this level of non-compliance to be a problem, does the nature of the activity allow you to consider time periods when well watching is prohibited? Mm -hmm. For example, morning, afternoon, etc. Interesting. Uh, and in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> they just left. I really them. <laughs> so in terms of um, including harassment in the compliance study, no, I don't believe harassment was evaluated um, in that study. It, but it does mention that even though there was non-compliance, the maybe harassment the, the intent of the guidelines is to help voters avoid harassment maybe that wasn't necessarily solved but there weren't any strikes special strikes noted in that time period of the study so at least that portion of the guidelines was met so that was a good outcome even though there was this high level of non-compliance and then i can't remember the second question daytime restrictions yeah. and i would suggest we've never discussed at all daytime restrictions and that um the, except the, to the extent that within the guidelines we speak to visibility uh and night operations so we ask in the guidelines we suggest be aware of reduced visibility due to darkness and uh please consider uh returning to port from whale watching by around by 15 minutes prior to sunset. And similarly, sunrise, you know, at 15 minutes after sunrise. So um, yes, daytime restrictions, we've never considered it. Um, there, there's no particular time of day that you can actually pinpoint and say. I mean, oftentimes I can say with, yes, Early morning is typically very good for whale activity, but you you know this it's nature. They can do no one tells them to, when to do what. Yeah. I will say anecdotally though, I don't know if you have this experience, Dave, but you know, it's like the last whale watch of the day, it's like four or five PM and you start heading home. And as soon as you start heading home, whales start doing like really cool behaviors and it makes you wonder like boat pressure's gone. Sure. Are they feeling good to get back to what they really want to do? Sure, maybe. Perfect. Very quickly. Do you, do you have more on the line? No, but we're no, but we're uh, uh, we're right. it's a yeah. super quick um, I don't know if you guys that were out on the water the other day noticed the difference in behavior of our whale watch boat and the other one. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty clear to me which was the better behaved boat. <laughs> And that's where I'll stop. <laughs> a, a rapid one. Just super rapid. Super rapid. Okay. In Mexico, for example, in one of the areas with the highest levels of whale watching, some researchers have the evidence that the modern cows abandoned that area and moved to an area with killer whales. So it put in a harassment or, or in a danger of that population. So it was an instrument to say to whale watchers, we have a problem here, you need to attend the regulations. I wonder if you have some information that can be used as a tool to say to the whale watchers, something is happening here, the behavior is changing, the population distribution is changing or something like that. I think one of the issues here is that, as Dave mentioned, a lot of a lot of our whales are 30, 40, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. They've they've grown up here and they've become habituated to this. You know, they come here to eat. They have to eat. Boats are around. They they kind of deal with it. Um, and a lot of the times they'll just stay and continue their behavior. And maybe there's impacts we're not seeing, stress hormones, for example, or other physiological impacts. Sometimes you'll get whales that leave. Sure, if, if a vessel comes in too quickly and they're like, see, I'm not dealing with this. But yeah, I don't think there's been anything like that that I can think of. 
Thank you very much. Um, so that brings the close and so thank you so much for your Perfect, thank you. um, yeah. night eight. <laughs> <laughs> and to, to everybody online as well, thank you, of course, for staying with us for so long and throughout all these. It's you know, always be a challenge listening online, but hopefully, you all found it useful and you've had people's email addresses after their presentations to reach out to them as well. Um, and of course, whilst a lot of this was about management um, in general and the activities at, at Stellwagen, but um, if you would like further information on the twinning, the Marine Mammals Management Toolkit that Ben was talking about as well, um, then please do feel free to reach out and, and download um, and access all those uh, useful resources. Um, any last words, Francis? No. <laughs> and on that inspiring note, <laughs> I think we'll we'll call it we'll call it an end then. But yeah, no. <laughs> okay, so again, thank you very much, everybody in line, and again, everybody in the room. Thank you very much uh, for your wisdom and, and, and your questions. So, and especially the speakers. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs>